Okay, just just one moment. Yeah, open. Okay, okay. We extend a warm welcome to everybody. We'll be starting in nine minutes from now, 4.30 Indian Standard Time. Hello, sir. Neeraj, sir. Good, Good afternoon, sir. I think uh, you'll have to make a Swaroop uh, 
Swarup as the panelist, right? Okay, okay, fine. Hello, sir. Oh, I can see. I can hear you. So we'll start in about a minute. Yeah, we'll start in a minute. Exactly 4.30, we'll start. Yeah, as usual, I'll just run through the uh, couple of slides and then... Uh... Yeah, and you'll have to introduce the speakers also. Yeah, yeah. I have a slide. So it's 4.30, we'll start the day by wishing a very, very many, many happy returns of the day on Niranjan's uh, birthday. He is the brain behind this uh, program, along with uh, Professor Alfergal, who came up with uh, such a beautiful program during this uh, time. So I again, wish a very, very happy birthday on behalf of all of us to uh, Niranjan. Thank you, boss.
Okay, so I think we are good to go. Um, just give me a moment. Yeah, um, so good evening, good afternoon, uh, good morning to some of you. Very warm welcome to the third uh, session of uh, Lockdown Learning. Uh, a couple of quick uh, housekeeping announcements before we move forward. These are our social media handles. Uh, please feel free to follow us uh, on uh, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and uh, LinkedIn. And uh, you know, know about our YouTube channel, Cyclops Learning Lab, where we live stream this program every uh, week. Plus, there are also hundreds of uh, uh, learning uh, videos uh, on our channel. So please do subscribe to that as well. So uh, use question and answer feature to ask questions. Uh, please do not use the chat feature as we won't be monitoring that. If you have any unanswered questions, mail it to academics at cyclopsmedtech.com. I repeat, A-C-A-D-E-M-I-C-S at cyclopsmedtech.com. And uh, it will be forwarded to speakers and they'll reply directly. Please add Cyclops IDs to your contact list. It will uh, prevent mails going into spam folder. And after the session, you'll get a feedback form. Please do fill it up. It will give us a lot of valuable inputs uh, in, uh, to our next uh, sessions. So today we have uh, four sessions, uh, one by Dr. Solara Sino on computerized uh, dynamic posturography, and then Dr. Avinash Vijlani would talk about role of physical examination in vertigo. Dr. Vijay Guge, a neurologist from Nashik, is going to present a case on sick sinus uh, syndrome manifesting during the VNG. And uh, Dr. Henry from Shillong is going to present a case on atypical uh, BPP. So the first presentation we have is from Dr. Solara. Um, she's a clinical uh, audio vestibular researcher at the Development Adaption and Handicap Laboratory at University of uh, Lorraine, France. Uh, her major academic clinical and research interests related to uh, newborn hearing screening and uh, balance assessment uh, in children. Uh, with this, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Solara. Thank you. Over to you. I'll stop my screen share and you can take over. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I just want to make sure that you're capable of hearing me properly and you're capable of seeing my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? We, we can see your screen. We can see your Perfect. screen. Perfect. So first of all, I want to thank everyone for the introduction and definitely C-Clubs for giving me the chance to talk about a project or a test that I really like, which is the computerized dynamic posturography. I was blessed to be part of the Arab Balance Society and I'm even uh, honored to be part of the European Society for Clinical Evaluation of Balance Disorder, where we usually um, kind of our pioneers in testing posturography. And um, this is why I want to discuss it further with you. I want to start with a few definitions that will provide us with the basic information regarding computerized dynamic posturography, but will allow us to understand better what are we testing. So we have two terminology, posture and balance. Posture is a term describing the orientation of any body segment relative to the gravitational vector versus balance is a term to describe the dynamic of body posture to prevent falling. Another important uh, term is center of gravity or cog. This is an imaginary point in space, which is, sum, uh, which is the sum of the forces and movement where are equal to zero. And um, in standing position, the cog is located within lower abdominal area of the trunk. Now, remember, on Earth, we have a uni uniform gravitational field. That's why the center of gravity and center of mass are almost the, uh, the same point. Versus when we are talking about non-uniform gravitational field, the center of gravity will not be at the same point at the center of mass. So because of the uh, principle of center of gravity are fusioning with center of mass, in some publication, you're going to see COM instead of COG. Okay, there are many factors that affect the location of cog in a human uh, body, and the, the first one is age. As you can see here, the older the person is, the older the person, this is a newborn here, the older the person is, 
the, uh, the cog is going to move away from the umbilicus. And the newborn, you see it above the umbilicus, just above it. In an adult, you see it very low. Another important factor is gender. Um, because of female versus male body composition, female location of cog is lower than that of male, as you can see in this picture here. Other factor affecting the cog are the height and weight. And the taller the person is, the position of the cog is going to move and definitely weight body composition is going to change the way that where the location of the cog is. And all of these are very important. Why? Because posturography is based on the idea of measuring uh, center of gravity, but we cannot quantify center of gravity. So we do it through um, a quantifying center of pressure. And what is exactly center of pressure? This is, um, uh, this is a vertical line coming from the center of mass or center of gravity toward a, a base of support, or if you want to come, we, when we want to measure it, it's going to be on a platform or um, a force plate. So the center of pressure is a, a projection, a vertical line projection downward from the center of mass toward this center, uh, toward this uh, force plate. As you can see here, that's the basic of stabilometry as well as posturography. Three important items I want to remind you of. Equilibrium, stability, and balance. Equilibrium is the state of balance in which all forces are equal. Stability is the resistance of disruption of this equilibrium. And the balance is our ability to control our equilibrium, changing body position. And we have three states or, or three types of equilibrium. Stable, unstable, or neutral. But stability is a bit more complex because what is our stability? Is being able to, uh, to maintain our balance, both in a static, a static and a dynamic situation. So in both cases, and there are many things that affect stability. Similar to cog, there are many factors and one of them is cog and height. What do I mean by this? A person who is short, their cog is placed, in a play, uh, is placed closer to the ground, hence he is more stable. So the taller the person is, uh, the taller the person is, the less stable he is. And that is a concept that is very well used in sports and uh, competition. The second factor affecting stability is the base of support. So the basic of support is very important. Why? Because the larger the base of support is, the more stable we are. We use this a lot in rehab as well. Factor affecting stability as well is the relation of line gravity to the uh, base of support, as you can see here. And this is the line of gravity. Here's a tennis player versus the base of support. Other factors that are very important, and uh, these are um, reminders for us when we're doing uh, rehab, are the surfaces. What are the property of the surfaces we work on? What's the level of friction? Uh, walking on ice is different, uh, on um, snow is different than walking on sand, is different than walking on um, a rug, etc. So friction is important. The softness of the supporting surface is important. And if we have an inclination of the supporting surface, because uh, uh, sometimes inclination, not sometimes, always, uh, a larger inclination will lead to further falls. A different aspect of it is the segmentation principle. And here, the segmentation principle is well seen in uh, um, scoliosis patients because of their weight and of their, um, uh, and their vertebral columns uh, and compared to stability. Finally, and this is where I feel a lot of co-founders and studies and posturography come into uh, consideration, are the factor affecting stability that are related to the person himself. And by this, I mean the mass, the weight, his vision, his ability to see properly, uh, physical and emotional state. And what I mean by physical and emotional state is that, especially in kids, for example, I will not perform a test when a child is too scared. Or even if he is stressed out, he will not be able to perform properly on a posturography because it's not completely, um, you need the feedback of the person. So physical and emotional states are going to affect stability. Uh, age, definitely, the, the, you have like a, a bell shape. The younger they are, uh, it's harder to, get, to be stable and then we peak. 
and then with age we deteriorate and finally pain i'm going to mention pain because pain may decrease stability especially if the pain affects the lower extremity if you have pain in your legs you're not going to be able to stand stable as you want it to stand so let's talk balance and cdp i've given you an overview of the important terms that you need to keep in mind but balance and cdp are is the purpose why you're here with me today so i'm going to start with um, vestibular dysfunctions that we see in our clinic on daily basis can affect people of all ages, children, adults, etc. And the causes of these vestibular dysfunction are so many. Some symptoms are, um, we, we go through audiometric evaluation for them, like hearing loss and tinnitus, uh, but we have a lot of uh, symptoms like uh, nausea and vertigo and even imbalance and fall that we need to uh, really look into not only uh, one test to be able to confirm these, um, uh, to, to review, I mean, uh, these uh, symptoms. This dysfunction that we're going to see are not only going to affect the person um, for a short period of time, it's, it may affect them for a very long period of time, and not only their physical, it will also affect their communication skills, their psychological behavior, uh, and children, it's gonna affect their school performance. Um, and adults, it may even affect their quality of life and professional life. This is why it's important to not only do a pathological diagnosis, but also do an impairment diagnosis, a functional limitation test. So we're gonna have all of these assessment of patient uh, uh, problem or dysfunction that will allow us to decide if we're going to go with a surgical intervention, pharmacological intervention, are we going to rehab? And the reason why we're doing all of this is to decide uh, to resolve the problem. But sometimes the problem is not resolved. And here we're going to have an impairment, which is defined as an organ level abnormality. We may have a functional limitation, which is for a period of time, the patient is not going to be able to do this daily activity. And once this functional limitation becomes very long or a very larger period of time and becomes indefinite, it becomes a disability. And I mention all of this because if you only do a pathology diagnosis, you only rely on testing, um, uh, testing the organs, you may not find all the things that may affect a person's lifestyle for a very long period of time. We usually rely on vestibular assessment. And by this, I mean autologic function like VAMP and OVAR. We can do um, VHIT and caloric tests. And all of these are going to give us very valuable information regarding pathologies. And we're going to be able, based only on the other tests, to decide what are the type of pathologies we may have. However, this is not enough. We need to do impairment diagnosis and functional limitation. And the reason why we need to do, to do that is that pathologies do not equally impair patient. So uh, with the same pathology, you can have different way or different people uh, uh, impaired differently. Uh, there is a huge difference between a person and a person, the way they're gonna be affected functionally by this disorder itself. So this is why I cannot only rely on performing a test for the pathology itself and one specific organ. I need to also do uh, impairment diagnosis. And one of these, we have many, but some of them are dizziness handicap index, which are questionnaires designed to measure the self-perceived disabling effect of um, caused by vestibular disorder. Sorry, we have a modified time and uh, go test. We have plenty of these tests. And uh, I think Dr. al uh, in his first uh, lecture went through, uh, through them in his four risk assessment management. I really recommend uh, to watch this uh, lecture if you haven't. And um, the last one of the, the last test, or I, I mentioned here, that is very important to provide information regarding functional limitation is the posturography test. What I'm trying to uh, explain is that posturography has been taken a lot of time to uh, help us identify the problem in quality of life and definitely the burden that affects the uh, uh, burden, economical burden that is related to vestibular test. And they, we have reached a stage where even people can apply based on computerized dynamic posturography, in addition to a lot of other tests, to get um, uh, support from government in some countries because they have vestibular disorders. So what is posturography that I've been talking about, uh, that I've been mentioning the title over and over again, and I didn't even define it. So it's a technique to quantify postural control and upright stance. We have two types. We have static posturography and we have a dynamic posturography. Okay, 
th here is a static posturography where I we place the patient or the subject in a standing posture on a force plate that you see here. The force plate has uh, con is connected to force and movement um, transducer or captive uh, the capture movement, uh, and then we're able to see if the body is swaying yes or no. So we're able to collect this information. The computerized dynamic posterography is advanced more than that. And I have here the three most, the two famous uh, uh, posterography and uh, Virtualis has a new one coming on the, uh, soon. So you have the computerized dynamic posterography by Neurocom that is becoming obsolete now. You have the Bertech here. Um, uh, both of these uh, were created by Louis Nash. Now we're going to go through quick history in a few seconds. And this is a new version which does not have um, surrounding, but you're using a virtual, re virtual reality mask. So it's a bit different. So what is the computer as dynamic posturography? What are we doing? We have here a platform, as you can see, and we have a surrounding. What we're trying to do is in an objectively uh, differentiating sensory and motor to and even central uh, adaptive function of an impairment that we have regarding balance. So the patient is going to stand still on this uh, platform and we're gonna uh, change the input we we're giving him. We're gonna manipulate the input uh, as we can. A quick history, in 1960, MIT and NASA led by Larry Young and his doctoral students started performing uh, um, uh, research regarding astronauts coming, uh, coming back. And this was later on developed by this doctoral student who is Dr. Valmis Nashner, funded by NIH. He was able to create the current CD, the, the CTP that I showed you in the first picture and was, uh, was uh, presented as a tool used by NASA. So that's in 1982. In 1986, it became commercially available by Equitest. And recently they added the VR in it and it became Vertec. So the computerized dynamic posturography is uh, officially uh, defined by the American Academy of uh, Otolaryngology and by the uh, American Academy of Neurology as a uh, quantifying sensory and motor contribution of balance. And further definition and explanation was given by Dr. Art Melanson in his Back to Basic Posturography lecture that he did a couple of days ago. And so I'm not going to go through a, a lot about the definition provided by these, by these two important um, academy. But I'm going to talk about what is function and definition of balance. Number one, if capability of standing still. So if the patient can stand still, that's a good sign. If he can move voluntarily, that's a very good sign. It's even better if he can uh, respond automatically to external changes and regain quiet stance, so if he can move and come back to it. And if you can do all three, when we are changing the environment, that means he's capable to do proper function and uh, to do balance functionally correctly. This is a slide that I think many of you know by now, where we're talking about the conceptual fr framework of, syst uh, of uh, the balance system. And by this, we're talking about the sensory input coming from the vestibular system for the visual system and so much sensory proprioceptive system. Information is then analyzed at the level of uh, integrated and analyzed at the level of the uh, central nervous system. And we have of the 3D flex coming back from the vestibular ocular, the 3D flex uh, permitting us to uh, to maintain our balance through the vestibular ocular reflex, motor impulse, and motor, uh, motor impulses through uh, con, um, uh, eye, eye movement and posture adjustment. But I wanted to take a moment and um, talk about a slide given by uh, Professor Kingma. He mentioned here two things that we always keep forgetting, or um, Dr. Fagher mentioned them, but I wanted to remind you of them. Hearing provides information regarding our balance, and gravitoreceptor, blood pressure sensor and large blood vessels, are going to provide additional information to maintain our balance. So please, whenever you see the old slide, don't forget that these are not the only things that are affecting our sensory input, and make sure you remember that it's somatosensory all of it, not only proprioceptor. This is, uh, uh, this is one of the um, schema or one of the figures that shows us that a balance control of center of, is center of, uh, is uh, uh, the balance in general is the control of center of mass over base of support. And that's done via integration of uh, sensory integration. And it's not a simple uh, 
basic uh, mathematical equation is affected by many internal and negative feedback that are going to, to affect also the way we see posturography. So we go back to the, the, the idea of cog balance uh, base of support and uh, center of pressure to be able to properly diagnose or not diagnose, sorry, to assess functionality of our uh, balance. So dynamic equilibrium is what we are testing in details or what we are assessing in detail in computerized, by, uh, computerized dynamic posturography. We have two parts of it. We have a sensory organization part of it and we have a motor coordination of it. And that are done through four tests, limit of stability, sensory organizational test, motor control test and adaptation test. The last two, I'm not gonna discuss a lot here, but they are related to reflexes. These are complete different lecture. We're gonna go, hopefully we'll be able to have a lecture about these two. I'm gonna focus today on limit of stability and SOT or sensory organization and test. But before, what are the component of the CDP? So the CDP is made of, uh, you see here a platform, uh, you see here the platform and you see the surrounding. The surrounding is being now, as I said, changed to virtual reality or you now no longer need a surrounding. You can have it with the mask, but the platform is very essential. And why do you need the platform? Because what we are doing with it is a, it's, it's biomechanic. We are, uh, uh, what we're doing is we are captivating your movements through your center of pressure. So that's why it's very important. And different system have different number of captor uh, um, movement, um, uh, collecting information regarding uh, movement. Okay. What we are doing exactly is we are measuring your sway. So uh, what I mean by postural sway, it's we are measuring the movement of the center of gravity that I mentioned previously within the base of support. So this is now is your base of support. And we're gonna mention, or gonna, sorry, measure your, uh, uh, your projection of the center of gravity into this platform through, through your COP. So your postural stabil stability now is going to the uh, horizontal level. We're gonna ask the patient, and that's a very important part. We're gonna make sure the patient is very, very well placed because if you do not place the patient properly or your properly, your data is no longer valid. And we're gonna make sure that he's wearing a harness for safety, but shouldn't be very tight because if you 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 put it very tight, what's going to do? It's going to affect his stability and it's going to affect how far can he go. That takes me to the next step. Who text? test, which I always do first, which is the limit of stability. I put the patient on the platform and the test consists of asking him to lean forward, lean backward uh, to these, uh, to the left, to the right, and all of these eight position. Our aim of this is to see what is the maximum anterior, posterior, lateral sway angle that the person can actually do. Normally, a normal person could move easily with a sway angle of eight degrees, front, left, right, and 4.5 degree only backward. So if a patient coming to me from the first stage is not able to do the maximum, uh, uh, maximum limit of stability that he can do, I know that we have a higher chance for him falling later on in the computerized dynamic posturography test uh, component of uh, and the component SOT. So I keep that in mind. This is why I always start with limit of stability. And honestly, you do not need, um, you do not need to uh, as a full system to do it. You can just do it yourself on, a, 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 you put a dot on the ground and you ask the patient to lean forward, lean backward, and you see what is their limit of stability. Make sure that you are next to the patient for them not to fall. This is the point of stability. Now let's talk about the second test, which is the sensory uh, organizational test. What is this test doing exactly? It's um, measuring the sway energy, as I said, under uh, uh, different or various uh, condition. We are going to test the somatosensory system by changing the surface or uh, under them. And this is by the movement of the platform. So uh, the other way of doing it is by changing um, uh, changing the uh, surface, which we're not going to do here. We're only going to do a surface change. We're gonna do check the visual system by turning off the lighting or turning it on. I usually ask them to close their eyes with children I put a scarf. We're gonna do movement of self uh, of self or environment. In this case, what's going to happen is that the platform is uh, that the surrounding of the platform is going to move uh, toward the patient and away from the patient or the subject. The vestibular system is not gonna be tested 
alone, it's gonna be, we're gonna eliminate the others to be able to test the vestibular system. And because it's providing, it's gonna, uh, it's, it's, it's affected mainly by gravity. So when a person is standing still, not doing any movement, 70% of the information is coming from the somatosensory. 10% is coming from his visual uh, input and 20% is coming from his vestibular input. This is under a stable surface condition, okay? Now, this sensory weighting becomes a re-weighting when the surface becomes uh, unstable. So I move the plat uh, platform. What's going to happen is that this uh, person now is going to rely only 10% on his somatosensory input, 30% on his visual input, and 60% on his vestibular input. And that's by a study done by uh, Moore and Al in um, uh, 2000. And that's a very nice study that I left the, doc the, the details here. I really recommend you to read it because it gives you the basic understanding of the condition that we're going to do next in posturography and then CDP. So these are the six conditions we're going to do. We're going to do six conditions, and each one of them is going to permit us to uh, study uh, a different uh, aspect of the uh, sensory input that we have. So condition one is for me my calibration, um, my calibration stage, if you want. Uh, patient is standing still, or subject standing still on the platform. He's able to see everything. So he is mainly using his sensory system. As we said, um, he is using 70% of the time his uh, somatosensory system. And it's an, there is all, um, all the sensory inputs are accurate and there is no compromised sensory input at all. Well, as the condition number two, I asked now the patient to close their eyes and they're still on a fixed support. What's going to happen when the, the vision is absent? We're gonna rely more on the somatosensory, okay? So when he's relying more on the somatosensory, uh, that does not mean that his vestibular input is not accurate. Uh, on the contrary, he, is, he has accurate sensory information from both his vestibular and somatosensory um, input. And um, it's important to note, although the vision is absent here, there is no compromise of sensory input, okay? And condition number three, what's going to happen is, is even, I will leave the support uh, the fixed support platform under him stable. However, now the sway reference is going to move. What's going to happen is he, he is going to see um, his visual surrounding is going to be absent. It's true he did not close his eye, but he's no longer seeing clearly if you want. There is a, a visual uh, visual, it's not a visual illusion, but a change of, of scenery. And that's where we are, we are uh, relying mainly on using his somatosensory. So again, in this condition, the person is relying mainly on his vestibular and somatosensory information, and the vision is compromised as a sensory input. So we are compromising here vision. Condition number four is, it becomes more interesting. So the most important condition for me are four, five, six. Why? Because condition four now, I removed uh, the, the sway reference. How? By making it moving. So the, 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 the reference or the platform under the patient is going to move. And this will alter proprioception and will ask the patient to use more his vision. So in condition number four, what's happening? We're going to get accurate information from the vestibular system and the visual system. And we're going to have a compromised sensory input from the somatosensory. Condition number five, we're going to ask the patient to close his eyes and I'm going to have a sway reference support moving. So the platform under his feet is going to move. His eyes are going to be very well closed. And what is going to happen again? We're going to get accurate information from the vestibular system alone. Why? Because vision is denied and somatosensory input is, uh, is uh, affected by the sway reference support being moving. Okay. Condition number six is the hardest of them all. Why? Because I'm gonna give, I'm gonna make sure that the movement of the movement of the platform and the surrounding are happening at the same time. Now, make sure you inform your patient of, be ahead of time of what's gonna happen in this condition because for some elderly and for kids sometimes they got scared. 
And the first uh, recording that you're going to do for this condition is usually a reaction they got scared of and not a real reaction. So make sure you inform them ahead of time exactly what's going to happen. And in this condition, as I said, we're moving both the surrounding and the platform. We are, again, relying on the vestibular system. We're only getting accurate information from the vestibular system. And we are compromising the sensory input from both the somatosensory and the vision. When we perform this test, we're gonna get a result looking like that. So you see here, all six condition, and you're gonna see something called equilibrium score, composite score, sensory analysis, strategy analysis, and cog alignment. We're gonna go through one by one. So the first one you see is uh, equilibrium scores here, and then you see a composite. This equilibrium score, okay, uh, gives us a general balance, a general information about the person's balance. And I find it very easy to, to explain to the patient as a tool versus other tests. So I can simply say, if you see a red, that means you didn't do as expected on this test. If you see it green, that means you did well. I am not sure if you're able to see it properly, but there is gray here. And the gray means you're, um, these are the, the passing grade. If you want for you to, to say that you did the test correctly. Um, this is one of the advantage of SOT. It's easy explanation to the patient. So we were talking about equilibrium score and the equilibrium score is calculated for each trial we do. And we're gonna do three trial for each um, condition. I usually do them randomly after the second condition. And each one, as I said, is 20 seconds. The closer they are to, like we have a score from zero to 100, zero is a fall, 100 is a perfect score. That means they did not sway enough. And we compare it in, com uh, in comparison to limit of stability, okay? Make, make sure that uh, you know that these gray areas here are known by age and by height. Uh, some studies, have been mentioning the importance of um, having it known by gender as well. So we'll see if this will be incorporated later on in the new data coming with virtual reality, yes or no. Okay. I have here also composite score. And that's the first thing I always look at after looking at conditions. I look at the composite score. The composite score is going to give me the average of the uh, uh, conditions from one to six. However, please note that is very important. This is a weighted average. So it's not we just uh, combine everything and divide them over six. No, there is a weight where uh, the most difficult condition, which means three, four, five, six, are weighted higher than the first two conditions. So keep that in mind. And um, for me, it's very, very important that I always look at the raw data, although I don't have here a picture of raw data, but it's very important to make sure that the, the patient actually fell and you and a, you put a zero next to it fall and not just only like if the, the, because it's a computer system at the end. So you need to make sure that you put in your input regarding uh, um, amplitude and frequency and duration and regulation of this way. So go back to the raw data, do not only rely on the bars. Okay, we may have an abnormal score. And usually any abnormal score less than 38 for me is high risk or 35 even, is very high risk of fall. And this needs to be reviewed with the physician uh, sending the patient for computerized dynamic posturography. So again, this is based on age, but for me, whenever I see a composite score low directly, I put a sticker saying high risk of fall, please take care of this patient. The third, uh, third component is sensory analysis here. So we see SO stands for somatosensory, the uh, VIS stands for vision, vestibular, and uh, uh, visual preference. So what do I mean by somatosensory? The somatosensory is how well does my patient use his somatosensory cues for balance? And this is, um, this is an equation of condition uh, two over condition one. So eyes closed versus eyes open. Vision here is how much the patient is able to uh, use input from the visual system to maintain his balance. And we're going to uh, compare condition four to condition one. We see here the vestibular ratio. And by the vestibular ratio, I mean, by the vestibular ratio here, I mean uh, condition five uh, over 
condition one. And this is how well does my patient is using his vestibular cues to maintain his pay, uh, his, his taste. Finally, visual preference. And visual preference is a bit more complicated when it comes to equations. But what is the aim is to see how much the patient is relying on visual information to maintain balance, even if the information is incorrect. Okay? These are the conditions. The second, uh, the, the, the next to the uh, next to the sensory analysis, we have strategy analysis and cog alignment. It's very, very important to always look at the cog alignment because if the patient fails and he's not, man, it does not return to where he needs to be, it will affect your overall measurement. So the cog alignment is representing the, po the, the, the position of the patient's body relative to the center of uh, foot support at the start of each and every single trial. So every single time you perform a condition, make sure that your patient is correctly aligned. Now, if the patient has himself a problem, okay, uh, or maybe have, um, uh, have a person has a condition that affects his cog alignment, then I need to take that into consideration when re reviewing the result, the raw data. And um, it's also affected by weight. So please take care if you have a heavy patient or an underweight patient, how you uh, see his or review his cog alignment. The, the last part of it is strategy, strategy analysis. And we can have two parts. We can have two strategies. We can have a hip dominant strategy or an ankle dominant strategy. And this is what you're going to see on your screen. You're going to see a hip dominant uh, strategy here, and you're going to see an ankle dominant strategy here if you have a fall. So it's what is the strategy used by the patient to stay stable, to maintain his stable? Will he, it's to, not to fall, okay? If a patient has an ankle dominant strategy, and he has an impairment that is usually, um, I have seen it, that it's mainly an impairment that is related to um, uh, inappropriate strategy selection of, uh, uh, of uh, he's not using the pr proper way of uh, not uh, holding himself from falling. And I've seen it uh, also in a lot of vestibular uh, patient. So whenever I see an ankle dominant strategy, I start thinking it could be a vestibular case. Uh, however, if you see it a hip dominant, this is mainly, it could be an ankle weakness, it could be um, sometimes the malingerer will use a hip dominant strategy instead of ankle. So review the strategy analysis because it's going to be very beneficial when we decide on the plan of rehab. Where do I use posturography? I use it a lot, personally, and I use it because it helps me differentiate peripheral sensory and central uh, nervous system abnormality and it permits me to decide where is the problem. Is it vestibular, visual, uh, somatosensory, a combination of all? And sometimes it's a good screening test ne for a neurological patient. These conditions and uh, ratios will permit me to create patterns. I have patterns where I have all the conditions abnormal that's called across the board. We have condition five and six abnormal that's called vestibular. Four, five, six is vestibular and vision. When we have two, three, uh, five and six is vestibular plus somatosensory. We have vestibular preference when we have three and six. Now, across the board is uh, and usually seen in patient where um, we are talking about a neurological problem. So a central or a central problem is usually where I see these across the board, everything is abnormal. Um, there is a possibility, and I've seen it in some patient where this pattern is seen in a vestibulospinal, um, a vestibulospinal manifestation of an autolytic defect. And Dr. Um, Art Manson has mentioned this, and this is a very nice study done by him and Dr. Neil Longreach about across the board um, cases. But for me, whenever I see a case like this, uh, I know that I'm sending this result to the neurologist. What if? What about the vestibular dysfunction or vestibular patterns? And we have a lot of these. We have it um, in cases of, for example, Meniere. We have it in cases of BPPV. And mainly what you're going to have is you're going to have abnormal result in condition five and six. So um, when you have abnormality in condition five and six, I start 
thinking this patient has difficulty on um, uh, to stay stable on surfaces when he is not able to see properly. And I mean by this in the dark, for example. Okay. A lot of studies have uh, correlated caloric and SOT and migraine patient and Meniere patient and vestibular neuritis patient. But what's important and what I want to keep reminding everyone is the degree of impairment may or may not correlate directly to the degree of the pathology seen and, seen and the pathological exam. And that comes back to the idea that different people um, have different impairment and different disorders. And it could be due to the interaction of multiple impairment or the brain's unique adaptivity to the, to the problem that we have, a disorder that we have, in addition to the psychological effect. And this is where the PPPD keeps on coming up in, in our literature. We may have a vestibular and vision problem. And when we have a vestibular vision problem is that uh, mainly these are the patients where um, uh, when the somatosensory cues are inaccurate, this patient is, is not able to uh, use other uh, sensory cues properly. We have possibility to find vestibular and somatosensory abnormality, as you can see here. And you see he's not able to do condition two, three, and he's falling in condition five and six. His composite score is low. His cock alignment is everywhere. He's falling and using ankle dominant. So we see patterns, and these patterns helps us a lot in deciding where is the problem, where is this, I'm not going to say site of problem, it's just indicative and how we are going to take care of rehab with this patient. We have other patterns that I'm gonna not, not going to go through in details, but I'm going to say, why do I use CTP in my clinic? First of all, it's a screening tool. For me, it's a screening tool helping me decide if I'm going to continue seeing this patient or should I send it to neurology. The second thing is to assess the risk of fall in this patient. And that's very important, especially in elderly. We're going to help um, a guide and monitor the balance rehabilitation plan. And we're going to quantify, if we can, functional impairment. And very, very importantly is what, when I do the for risk, it's allow me to decide to monitor this for risk and work on it later on, as I said. And the other thing that I've been doing is, uh, personally, I haven't done, but I've been reading about, is the importance of computerized dynamic posturography in space uh, and astronauts. What we have been working on in our um, lab is using uh, CDP with cochlear implant patients. So posturography permits me a lot to see how they are doing uh, 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 across different age groups. So we keep on uh, monitoring their, uh, their uh, balance control. And although not everyone is gonna like what I'm gonna say, I need to say it clearly. Yes, even after six, eight, 10 years, these children with a unilateral cochlear implant will not do great on a CDP. And compared to the same age group, same height, same weight, same gender. So keep that in mind. And hopefully you're gonna, I'm, I'm, we're publishing this data very soon. And this has been already established by, um, by Dr. Uh, Cushing, uh, by different, um, different uh, uh, authors across the globe telling us that posturography showing your function uh, function limitation is clear in cochlear implantation so keep that in mind we have used it with uh, military and we have used it in uh, uh, sports so uh, just going to say this one of the articles coming from our lab where we uh, where dr uh, professor perrin was able to show that Different um, athletes use different sensory uh, uh, ratios. We cannot use them the same. And this will help them um, if you, you give them an assessment prior and post. Uh, this will help them in what exercise they need to do, where they need to work harder, so they become more stable. And um, uh, if they are stable, they will they perform better. And finally, my main aim in all of this is to show my patient after a while this green, um, green result, where he came to me with complete results that are negative, or not negative, but red and abnormal. And after rehab, I show him this. 
I have seen CDP do wonders just by showing the result to the patient, showing that you are in green, okay? Showing the patient that, uh, yes, I believe you, functionally you're, you have a problem, brought so much um, comfort to the patient. Um, mainly, I know that CDP is very expensive, but I am 100% sure that it's worth every investment because at the end, our aim is to make sure that the patient not only is no longer in, impaired, but also his uh, uh, life, quality of life is improved. And CDP allows us to quantify this improvement. I thank everyone for uh, joining us today. I'm just wondering if I still have a minute or two or where uh, I crossed my time. I think we are on time. I think you've got just in time. Perfect. Thank you thank so you. much. Yeah, so please stay on. Uh, the question sure. answer session is towards the end. Sure. Uh, Dr. Pratik is moderating and uh, he will collate all the questions and uh, uh, ask uh, relevant questions to relevant speakers. So uh, thank you so much. Okay, great. So thank you so much for that comprehensive presentation, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so now we move on to uh, our uh, next presentation uh, for the day uh, on role of physical examination in vertigo by Dr. Avinash uh, Bijlani uh, from Delhi. Dr. Bijlani is a senior ENT specialist with uh, special interest in the field of neurotology. He's been associated with corporate hospitals in Delhi earlier in his career, including mm -hmm. uh, Fortis Hospital. In the recent times, he has been solely practicing vertigo management uh, and rehabilitation from his dedicated medical center in Delhi. He has been a speaker at various conferences and workshops on the subject. A uh, very warm welcome to Dr. Bijlani. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Niranjan. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. You can start yeah. your screen share. Yeah, sure. And uh, before I begin, a very, very happy birthday to you. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Thank you, thank you Team Cyclops, Mr. Niranjan and everybody out there for having invited me for uh, today's talk. So I'll just begin. So friends, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the importance of physical examination in vertigo. Sir, your screen is not showing, sir. It's not showing? Just no, a moment, just a moment. I'll have to go back to it. I think I'll have to share the screen. Just give me a moment. Yes, sir. Is it uh, showing now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, great. Wonderful. Continue, sir. Okay, I'll just have to go back over for a moment. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. So, well, uh, nobody can uh, really deny the importance of a good physical examination, uh, which is only second to a good history taking uh, when you're facing a patient with vertigo. And uh, our ultimate goal being to arrive at a reasonable diagnosis in every patient of vertigo that we get. And uh, this definitely depends upon a good clinical examination, which stands, again, I say, uh, second to a good history. And a good examination of the eyes for the type of misdiagnosis, again, holds great value. So uh, what we intend to do during a physical examination of the patient is to, uh, while examining the patient, arrive, uh, try and arrive at the topographical diagnosis. By this, I mean that uh, uh, we know very well that uh, the vestibular labyrinth, the two eyes, and the proprioceptors uh, are the major sources of input to the uh, brainstem, where the process is uh, made. And uh, then there is a lot of interaction with the cerebellum. And of course, uh, cortex also fine tunes these things and then uh, uh, you know works out. So over here, I would like to uh, impress upon you that the neurotologist uh, 
basically has to uh, behave like a detective you know looking for always looking for clues uh, when examining the patient because everything might tell us each part of the physical examination is sort of destined to give us a hint as to which sector the problem lies in uh what about the cerebellum here cerebellum has a very much major and central role uh to be played in the vestibular system it has an immediate online role that is making every individual eye movement accurate immediately and a long term adaptive function uh, which is required for a calibration of the oculomotor responses so our main focus in the cerebellum is on the vestibular cerebellum so when does the examination of our patient begin i would say the moment the patient enters my consultation room or if they are called to the ward or the emergency room it begins then and there by looking at the patient now look at this patient who had just come in sorry the video is only half shown here for the sake of privacy of the patient you can see that she has a wide based gait she is swaying from side to side and uh, if you are to see this patient a patient in the emergency ward in that situation we have to uh, see in what posture the patient is lying on the bed a patient with who has immediately suffered an acute uh, vestibular pathy would be lying with the affected ear upwards uh, to be in, in an attempt to avoid uh, the uh, horizontal nystagmus developing from the intact side and we can make the patient sit up if he cannot stand and look for truncal ataxia which points towards a cerebellar or a central cause so next i move on to the romberg or the standing test Uh, we just talked about uh, visual vestibular and proprioceptive contributions to the vestibular system from the periphery so romberg says is nothing but asking the patient to stand and uh, following that we go on sharpening the test sorry next we make the patient close the eyes so that the visual cues are lost next we ask him uh, stand in the tandem position that is heel to toe and uh, can still make it sharper by asking the patient to stand on one leg for about 20 seconds or so a foam can be used to get rid of the proprioceptive uh, not totally get rid of it but to reduce the proprioception and finally standing on one leg in order to further reduce the proprioception a positive romberg would be seen in the acute phase of a peripheral vestibular disorder and the patient would fall to uh, will tend to fall to the affected side it's also positive in dorsal column or severe peripheral neuropathy lateral pulsion uh, can happen in lateralized uh, brain stem lesions or cerebellar lesions and uh, the patient tends to fall backwards that is retropulsion in a uh, case of midline uh, brain stem uh, lesions now this is the same patient you saw earlier you can see the way she is swaying she is a case of central pathology next we come to the unterberger's or fukuda's stepping test it's very simple ask the patient to stretch his hands out and rapidly uh, walk at the same point and uh, it basically uh, the imbalance is elicited in case of an acute vestibulopathy if the patient suddenly turns to one side 
The first video I'm going to show you is of a patient who was seen on the second day after developing a vestibular neuritis. You can see how he's, while walking, he's swaying to the left. He had a left-sided acute vestibular neuropathy and uh, had a very strong right beating nystagmus also. This is a patient seen around seven to 10 days post unilateral vestibulopathy, again of the left side. Just watch out. He'll, he'll be falling towards the left. He has a tendency to fall to the left. Okay. So next I move on to uh, the tests for coordination. The simplest thing that can be done in the clinic is a finger nose test wherein a patient is asked to rapidly outstretch his arm, rapidly touch his uh, nose from a distance first with the eyes open and then with the eyes closed. Basically in response to peripheral inputs, a certain coordinated movement is carried out utilizing a particular group of skeletal muscles. And this is again a, center, uh, a central uh, function controlled by the cerebellum. And uh, the lesions uh, that you can uh, unmask over here is uh, dyssynergia or uh, dysmetria. Uh, dyssynergia would mean that the movements would be clumsy and in dysmetria, the patient will either overshoot or undershoot. There are other methods also to test coordination and to test the cerebellar function. One is the heel knee test in which the patient is asked to uh, move his heel uh, of one leg onto the shin of his other leg. And then uh, when one can ask the a patient to supinate and pronate uh, both his hands alternately, one over the other. And uh, a defect uh, over here is termed as dystiadocokinesis. So moving on to the most important part of the physical examination, uh, that is the ocular motor examination of the patient. So I'll not go into the detail of the uh, function of each moment here. I'll discuss them when I, as and when I reach the particular tests of these uh, eye movements. But uh, basically you have the gaze holding or the fixation function, which holds the image of the stationary object onto the fovea with the head immobile. And then you have the vestibular, that is the vestibular ocular reflex. Uh, the angular vestibular ocular reflex comes from the semicircular canals and the translational vestibular ocular reflex comes from the portolates. Uh, then you have the optokinetic, you have saccades, you have the smooth pursuit and also versions. So coming to spontaneous nystagmus, uh, one has to observe uh, the type of nystagmus whether it's a jerky nystagmus or a pendular nystagmus. A jerk nystagmus would uh, have a, a slow phase and a fast phase, whereas a pendular nystagmus has two, phase, uh, two slow phases. Next comes the assessment of the direction of the spontaneous nystagmus, whether it's horizontal, it's mixed, or it's vertical, or it's a torsional nystagmus, or is it a periodic alternating nystagmus whether the nystagmus pattern is conjugate in both the eyes or not, and also the effect of fixation on the intensity of the nystagmus. Then uh, there are certain provocative tests we do, like the Valsalva or the Hennebert sign inducing pressure into the external artery canal, and the sound or head shaking, hyperventilation, positional or positioning nystagmus. We'll come to that in due course of time. So how to differentiate between a peripheral type of nystagmus and a central type of nystagmus? So the features of peripheral nystagmus are that uh, it's by and large always a mixed horizontal torsional nystagmus. Uh, the quick phases uh, beat away from the uh, side of the lesion. The slow phase always has a constant velocity. Uh, the nystagmus increases on removal of fixation. If you're using frontal glasses, it increases on using, uh, on, on using Frenzel glasses, or if you have a VNG system, if you put a shutter in front of the goggles, the nystagmus increases. And peripheral nystagmus follows Alexander's law, thereby meaning that uh, 
on looking uh, in the eccentric uh, gaze of uh, on the uh, intact site, the intensity of the nystagmus will increase. The central type of nystagmus may be horizontal, pure torsional, or pure vertical. Here I would like to say, by and large, most central nystagmus is also horizontal. So uh, nobody should ever be mistaken looking at horizontal nystagmus alone and thinking that it's a peripheral uh, uh, lesion that he's dealing with. Uh, this uh, central nystagmus can be direction changing and it is usually poorly suppressed with uh, fixation. The slow phases uh, may have an increasing or decreasing velocity. It may increase with gaze away from the direction of the fast phase, and there may be a dissociation in the nystagmus between the two eyes. So I'll show you I anything? Okay. So this is using uh Brussels. That's on the one left, that I had developed uh, with the use of a sturdy frame and uh, 20, 20 diopter convex lenses, you can see the right beating nystagmus in this patient. Now this is on a VNG system. So in fact, uh, the Cyclops system that I'm using, you can see a right beating nystagmus. This is with fixation. Next, this is without fixation. You can make out the intensity of the nystagmus has become much more as compared to the previous one. So here's an example of a downbeating nystagmus, which is uh, usually seen with lesions of the flocculus and paraflocculus and happens basically because there's a release of the inhibitory pathways on the inherent upward eye movement bias from the semicircular canals. It can be seen in cervical junction, cervical, uh, craniocervical junction lesions like the Arnold Chari malformation disease uh, like multiple sclerosis or also with uh, vertebrobacillar insufficiency. In fact, this vertical downbeat nystagmus may be uh, due to an already leaky neural integrator, uh, which has been exposed by the uh, lesion in the flocculus. Upbeating nystagmus is much less common as compared to downbeat and uh, usually seen in brainstem or cerebellar infarcts, but always a strong indicator of CNS involvement. I think this video is not playing properly. I'll go ahead to the next slide. So coming to gaze holding. So the gaze holding uh, properties, they lie in the nucleus propositus hypoglossi, that is the neural integrator for uh, horizontal uh, gaze and supported by the medial vestibular nucleus and controlled by the cerebellum. The neural integrator for vertical gaze holding lies in the interstitial nucleus of Cajal, supported by the superior vestibular nucleus and the perihypoglossal nuclei. So in these two videos, you can see a right beating gaze nystagmus on right gaze and a left beating gaze nystagmus on left gaze. The job of these neural integrators is to mathematically convert the velocity of the eye to position, which is the position is what is read by the CNS. So one sees a horizontal gaze evoked nystagmus uh, in lesions of the pons, rostral medulla, or the vestibular cerebellum. And a vertical gaze evoked nystagmus indicates a focal midbrain, a midbrain lesion uh, in the area of the interstitial nucleus of Cajal. Now an important point here is that the gaze evoked nystagmus has to be differentiated from the spontaneous uh, nystagmus of vestibular origin. So here the uh, what one has to see is that the spontaneous uh, nystagmus or vestibular origin always uh, follows uh, Alexander's law. That is, it would be more intense on the side of the lesion, whereas this uh, horizontal gaze uh, evoked nystagmus might even behave in an opposite manner. 
Another thing that it has to be differentiated from is the physiological endpoint nystagmus. Physiological endpoint nystagmus has a low amplitude as compared to the horizontal gaze evoked nystagmus. It's a low frequency nystagmus. And above everything else, this is an unsustained nystagmus, whereas the horizontal gaze evoked nystagmus is always a sustained nystagmus. So what about rebound nystagmus over here? What happened in rebound uh, nystagmus is that uh, once the uh, uh, eyes come over to the mid, uh, straight ahead uh, gaze uh, from the eccentric gaze location, uh, the nystagmus changes its direction. And this usually is seen with flocular and paraflocular lesions. Then another interesting uh, type of nystagmus that we see in central lesions is the periodic alternating nystagmus. This periodic alternating nystagmus is one which uh, changes its direction every couple of minutes. So one has to observe for a slightly longish period of time to be able to elicit the periodic alternating nystagmus, which is usually associated with uh, the lesions of the nodulus in the cerebellum. So having talked about uh, the nystagmus in detail, I will talk about uh, a simple and quick clinical examination. Sometimes we do lack time and uh, we have to uh, make our decision regarding the patient uh, a little faster. So we have already talked uh, in detail about the nystagmus and uh, I'll now be talking about the head impulse test and test for skew deviation and the importance of hearing. In fact, the plus here indicates that a test for hearing is also important. So head impulse test is basically a very important test uh, uh, when you have to assess a patient's vestibular ocular reflex. The, when, the, when, when the head turns to the right, the eyes automatically move to the left in order to fixate the objects, object of interest in front of the eyes. And this uh, movement is equal and opposite. Now, how to perform this test? The patient's head is held firmly between the two hands. My nose. The patient is asked to look at the nose of the examiner and we have to make abrupt small amplitude movements to either side, not uh, ranging beyond 10 to 15 degrees. This test is based on evolved second law, which says that uh, excitation uh, always produces a bigger response as compared to inhibition. So in a normal person, the eyes would move pretty well in the opposite direction and rather smoothly. Whereas in unilateral vestibulopathy, when the head is turned to the defective side, now here when I move in this video, you can see that as I move the head to the left, the eyes make a rightward movement, but with correct, corrective saccades. Whereas when I make a rightward head movement, the eyes move to the left without any corrective saccades. My nose. Similarly, one can test the utricle also. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a video for this, but uh, the patient's head is held and the, uh, we give a uh, heave to the head uh, to either side, to the left or the right, and look for saccades. And if you get saccades, it indicates a utricular dysfunction. So now coming to skew deviation. Here, uh, what is of importance is to look for three things. One is a difference in the vertical alignment of the two eyes. One eye is higher than the above, and this can be done using the cover-uncover test. Whereas uh, the second thing that you have to look for is whether the patient's head is tilting to one side. Usually in peripheral disorders, the head tilt is towards the affected side. Here's one of my patients, when you can look at his eyes, you can see that the one eye is higher than the other. So basically the ocular tilt reaction consists of tilt of the head, a counter rolling of the two eyes to the side of the vestibular hypofunction, 
and a skewed deviation of the eyes, thereby meaning that there is a vertical misalignment of the two eyes. Now here also topographical diagnosis can be made uh, because uh, ocular tilt reaction can be seen in unilateral peripheral deficit of the otolith and vertical canal input as well as a unilateral lesion of the graviceptive brainstem pathways from the vestibular nuclei to the interstitial nucleus of Cajal. So how to differentiate? See, any lesion that happens in the caudal pons or the medulla or in the peripheral vestibular system, this will lead to ipsilateral tilt of the head, a con uh, an ocular counter roll in the direction of the tilt, and the affected side, the eye would be lower, and the opposite side, the eye would be higher. Any lesion that is occurring in the uh, rostral pons or in the mesenchephalon would give rise to a tilt in the opposite direction, and that is because of the crossing over of the MLF. Similarly, subjective visual vertical is also a good outpatient uh, test uh, for uh, otolith function and the uh, integrity of the graviceptive gravis pathways. Here, a patient is uh, given a bucket which has markings on the outside and uh, a pointer on the inside and a deviation uh, of the visual vertical by more than two degrees is considered as abnormal. Now, why is test for hearing in a patient of vertigo important? Uh, first of all, uh, the patient of vertigo, particularly an acute uh, vertigo patient, will not come uh, complaining of hearing loss, but he would come complaining of his vertigo, because in the uh, kind of uh, jeopardy that he has fallen into, he has totally forgotten about whether he's having a hearing loss in one ear or not. Another thing is that Meniere's disease, uh, we have a typical pattern of hearing in the initial stages, you get a low frequency loss, later on, uh, all the frequencies are equally affected. It's also important in recognizing a transient ischemic attack uh, that has been happening. Uh, and if the hearing loss is detected, we might be in a position to prevent an ICA attack. Then in an acute uh, brainstem stroke, uh, one can make out a difference whether uh, brainstem or cerebellar stroke and and or cerebellar stroke, one can uh, make out the difference between ICA and uh, PICA lesion because ICA would usually be uh, associated with a hearing loss. And uh, we can also unveil ischemic or inflammatory or compressive lesions of the eight nerve by testing for hearing. A good bedside test or an OPD test can be done using a two fifty at least a 256 hertz and a 512 hertz a tuning fork. Now, high frequency head check is another uh, informative test wherein the uh, patient's head is uh, rotated uh, to either side at a very high frequency of about three cycles per second. And this is done for something like about 10 seconds. And uh, if you get a nystagmus, this indicates an imbalance in the dynamic function of the vestibular system. Uh, one would uh, usually get uh, nystagmus that is at first uh, beating towards the affected side and then it reverses its direction to the intact side. This is a result of asymmetrical peripheral inputs uh, during high head rotations, high velocity head rotations. Uh, okay, this you have seen and there is this is the video on the right hand side of your screen shows the nystagmus for it's a right beating nystagmus that you can see over here so nystagmus following high frequency head shake uh, is seen in cases of uh, vestibular neuritis, which are being seen after quite a long time. And uh, it helps us unmask the vestibular imbalance, which has otherwise, in some cases, been compensated. Acoustic neuroma, small acoustic neuromas might be, uh, might give rise to this type of an nystagmus following high frequency head shake. It's seen in some cases of Meniere's disease also. And for unknown reasons, some patients of BPPV also show a nystagmus on high frequency head shaking. 
So I already talked a little bit about the pathophysiology. It's basically a combination of tone gain and timing asymmetry with a velocity storage mechanism being affected. Now here, what I would like to tell you is about perverted nystagmus. So when you uh, are doing a horizontal head shake and you get a vertical nystagmus, this is what is called a perverted nystagmus and it's usually associated or rather always associated with a central lesion, usually cerebellar lesions. Or if you get a, some people do vertical head shake also. So if you get a horizontal nystagmus on performing a vertical head shake, even then that is pointing towards a central lesion. So coming to high uh, smooth pursuit eye movements, these are slow eye movements which serve to stabilize the image of a small moving object in front of the eyes onto the fovea. And the neural substrate for smooth pursuit eye movements lies in the visual cortex, the parietal and frontal cortical areas, the cerebellum and the pons. So the patient is made to sit in front of the examiner at a distance of about half a meter. And uh, we make slow oscillations of the examiner's finger at a speed of about 10 degrees per second. I'm showing horizontal uh, smooth pursuit over here. You can also look at the way the eyes of the subject are moving smoothly. Uh, it should be done for horizontal and vertical movements both. So when do you get an impaired smooth pursuit? It's either due to cortical, pontine, or cerebellar lesions. In the cerebellum, it's usually the oculomotor vermis or the fastigial oculomotor region uh, that have gone wrong. And uh, this is uh, termed as a saccadic or a pog wheel pursuit. So you show one video, uh, one video of a very bad saccadic pursuit. You can see the cogwheel pattern or the saccadic pattern of the smooth pursuit in this patient. So while this video is playing, I would like to bring in opto optokinetic nystagmus also. Uh, basically, optokinetic nystagmus is a combination uh, response of the smooth pursuit system and the optokinetic system. Sir, we cannot see the video, sir. You cannot Not able to see the video. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm sorry. I think what I'll do is I'll skip it now because I don't think I can really help much. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay, forget it. I'm sorry about the thing. It was a very nice video. I would, I would have been very happy to have everyone see it. Maybe you can just click on that link. I think I'll do it towards the end. Okay. okay. Uh, yes, sir. that would be great, yeah. sir. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it towards the end. Okay. So, uh, what about the optokinetic test? Basically, uh, an optokinetic response is a combination of the uh, uh, smooth pursuit and the optokinetic system. And this is something that can be used to detect an asymmetry of the smooth pursuit uh, mechanism and also saccades. So I'm not talking about optokinetic uh, test separately. Now I'll come to another thing uh, that is the visual fixation suppression of the VOR. This is a test done to again differentiate between central and uh, peripheral uh, pathologies. Here, there are two ways to go about it. One is when the examiner asks the patient to hold something in his hand or at least look at his thumbs and move the head and the hands synchronously on either side. Or the patient can be holding a tongue depressor between his teeth and his, uh, between his teeth in the mouth and rotating the head. So if you see corrective saccades, they indicate a disturbed uh, visual fixation suppression of the VOR. And this is again a cerebellar disorder usually seen in flocular and paraflocular lesions. Now there's something very interesting I came across while reading a few days back. If the VOR cancellation is normal, 
but the smooth pursuit is impaired. This reflects a hypofunctioning BOR. Now, something about the saccades. These are the fastest mo uh, eye movements seen, and uh, they can range anywhere from 300 to even 600 uh, degrees per second. And what is to be seen is that uh, uh, they happen when uh, an object is of interest is uh, suddenly uh, changed. And this is reflect, uh, reflexive saccades or it can be memory guided saccades. Reflexive saccades occur uh, when they are triggered by the appearance of a new visual object. Memory guided saccades are carried out to a target location where the target had been previously seen by the subject. Now to test for saccades in the outpatient department and uh, you don't have a VNG system, then it's very simple that you present the two fingers of the hand or a couple of pens or one finger and one pen at a distance from the patient's eyes and ask him to alternately look at the two fingers. Note the accuracy of the velocity and the conjugacy of the two eyes. Now the burst neurons of the saccade generator for the vertical uh, saccades lie in the rostral interstitial nucleus of the medial longitudinal fasciculus, that is the RIMLF, and for the horizontal, they lie in the PPRF, that is the paramedian uh, pontine reticular formation. Slow saccades are indicative, uh, if you have uh, horizontal slow saccades, they are indicative of a lesion in the pons. Vertical uh, slow saccades are seen with rostral midbrain uh, lesions. And uh, unilaterally slow saccades would be uh, indicative of an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. So here I have a diagram, a very nice diagram shared with me by Dr. Prateek Porwal, in fact. Uh, here it shows a right MLF lesion. And when the patient is asked to look to the left side, I mean, when the patient is asked to look to the right side, uh, the eyes move conjugately, and there's a rightward movement of both the eyes. Whereas when the patient is asked to look to the left, the uh, right eye is unable to adapt properly. Or it could be slow. That's the point. That's the reason I'm showing it to you over here, along with the saccades. But normally, virgins uh, is uh, preserved uh, in these patients because uh, virgins follows a different pathway. The saccades can be dysmetric. That is, uh, they can be an overshoot or an undershoot of the saccades. And this uh, points to a cerebellar lesion. Hypometri hypometric saccades are seen in uh, lesions of the do dorsal vermis. Hypermetric saccades are seen in posterior fastigial nucleus lesions. And delayed initiation of saccades may occur with a cortical lesion. Hyperventilation is another provocative test. The patient is asked to hyperventilate ranging from 30 seconds to about 60 or 70 seconds. And the pathophysiology behind this is that it leads to uh, a hypocapnia and, uh, and a rise in the pH which results in an improved conduction in the otherwise hypofunctioning eighth nerve. This is something which is seen. Uh, and one other purpose that uh, hyperventilation serves is that if the patient uh, becomes dizzy and uh, develops some other symptoms also, without developing a nystagmus, this usually reflects an anxiety and it's seen in uh, patients uh, who would be having functional dizziness. Otherwise, one can see uh, nystagmus in microvascular compression uh, disorders like the neurovascular compression of the eight nerve, termed as vestibular paroxysmia, small acoustic neuromas, and in 
cases of vestibular neuritis where the nerve has been partially affected. Now, a word or two about the pressure sensitivity tests. Uh, usually, we do these tests when we suspect a semi sem uh, superior semicircular canal dehiscence or a stapes subluxation, vestibular fibrosis, perilymph, fistula, another condition which may elicit uh, nystagmus uh, with the induction of pressure is uh, something that was done in the yesteryears, the fenestration surgery could also be seen in uh, Arnold Cherry malformation and in cardiovascular disorders. So there are two ways to perform the Valsalva maneuver, which is the commonly used method to uh, look for nystagmus and vertigo following uh, pressure changes. One is the glottic Valsalva depicted well in this picture where a person is uh, advised to, the patient is asked to be in the squatting position against a closed glottis or one could ask the patient to blow the cheeks with a closed mouth and the pinched nostrils. Another way to conduct a pressure sensitivity test is the Hennebert sign or the fistula test, where initially tragal pressure was advised, but uh, one would always prefer the pneumatic otoscope. Now coming to positional and positioning uh, tests for nystagmus. Well, uh, there has been a bit of a controversy whether uh, the positional tests are the same or we should term them separately as positional or positioning tests for nystagmus. Uh, basically, positional tests uh, refer to uh, a static uh, situation where the nystagmus appears uh, on a change in head position, that is in a new static head position, and persists to be there as long as the head remains in the new static head position. Whereas positioning tests are uh, dynamic tests where the nystagmus appears in the uh, with a change in the head position, but uh, decays if the position is maintained thereafter. Not be talking much about BPPV, which is a commonest uh, disorder for which uh, positional tests are done. This video depicts the torsional upbeating nystagmus in a Dick-Solpike test that was done in a case of posterior canal BPPV. Rather, I would like to uh, tell you a little about the algorithm that I follow. If a patient comes to us with a history of BPPV and the positional test is done and we don't see any nystagmus and we don't get any vertigo, not necessary that the patient is not suffering from BPPV. It could be due to the fatigue or the nystagmus. It's fatigable and or the patient has gone into remission by the time he has reached the physician. Or the other thing is a different etiology, which would require a further investigation. Now, the, another condition is, uh, or rather another situation is when uh, the positional test is done, uh, we get vertigo, but uh, we cannot elicit any nystagmus. And if the liberatory maneuver results in resolution of the symptoms of the patient, uh, we label it as subjective BPPV. But if uh, under the same circumstances, vertigo being present and no nystagmus being present and the liberatory maneuvers are done, do not result in any resolution, definitely uh, needs further investigation and other uh, etiologists have to be thought in terms of central positional and positioning vertigo. A few tips I would like to share on positional vertigo. One should never go exclusively by the patient's version. In every patient presenting with recurrent short lasting episodes of vertigo, positional tests should be performed. And one should not confuse the typical horizontal nystagmus of lateral canal BPPV, uh, which uh, comes on a Dick Solpike test. It can often be seen, but then uh, do not label it as a posterior canal BPPV because the nystagmus is a horizontal nystagmus. It is the direction of the nystagmus which follows the particular canal being stimulated which dictates as to which canal is affected. Another thing is that a central vestibular lesion of vestibular nuclei or the caudal cerebellum can mimic the nystagmus of lateral uh, horizontal canal BPPV. One must always assess downbeat positional nystagmus neurologically and think of imaging in these patients 
because anterior canal BPPV is a rarity. Unless you get a typical downbeat nystagmus with a torsional component on either uh, the dick saw pipe or the head hanging uh, position. And you're able to correct it with the namaz position, uh, which Dr. Uh, Srinivas has discussed with me, or the conventional Yakovino maneuver. So if you're able to uh, treat the patient, the patient is asymptomatic, you don't see the nystagmus anymore uh, on uh, repeating the uh, diagnostic test, fine. Otherwise, this patient needs a neurological, for the neurological assessment. Vestibular migraine can commonly present as positional vertigo. And this nystagmus pattern that we see is usually of a central type, which is non-fatigable. It can be direction changing and will never respond or rather will never correspond to the canal being tested. So towards the end, I would like to talk about certain things which we as uh, ENT specialists or even neurologists tend to uh, forget about one must check the blood pressure of the patient. One reason I can uh, quote for checking the blood pressure is because if the patient is hypertensive, he is more prone for something uh, that has to do with the uh, cardiovascular, sorry, the vascular strokes. Another thing you can test uh, while checking the blood pressure is to test for uh, orthostatic hypotension. These patients usually complain of uh, dizziness or vertigo on getting out of bed or having been sitting for a long time, once they get up, they complain of dizziness. A simple way to uh, test for orthostatic hypotension is to make the patient lie down for a few minutes and uh, measure the blood pressure, ask the patient to stand up with the cuff on and again check the blood pressure. If there is a significant difference uh, of about 20 uh, millimeters of mercury uh, in the systolic blood pressure and the difference of 10 millimeters of mercury in the, uh, systo uh, in the diastolic, then one can suspect the patient to be suffering from orthostatic hypotension. Must check the pulse, pulse of the patient because uh, if you find an irregular pulse, you might be dealing with a case of cardiac arrhythmia because cardiac arrhythmias also lead to dizziness. Should check the facial sensation of the patient, uh, very easy, uh, just keep the uh, foot end of the, or the back end of the tuning fork, the stem of the tuning fork onto the cheek and uh, ask the patient whether he feels the tuning fork cold or not. And uh, pain can be uh, tested using a pin prick. And uh, if you get something positive, should always check the uh, sensation in the opposite side, the extremities also, because uh, you might be dealing with uh, long track signs. Vertebral artery testing is another uh, thing I would like to talk about. Uh, very simple to do. Just ask the patient to turn his head by about uh, 90 degrees to the opposite side and uh, look for nystagmus, which is usually a, not a very intense nystagmus, but if you do get it, it it's, it's indicative of uh, compromise of the vertebral artery on the opposite side, which could be due to impingement of the vessel by osteophytes or degenerative changes of spondylosis. Even otherwise, this is a good test uh, to be done before the dick solpite test because uh, you'll not be putting the patient into jeopardy once you do a dick solpite test on a patient uh, suffering from a problem of vertebral artery. Facial palsy has to be looked for and so many other things have to be looked for because uh, we have to look at the neighborhood symptoms also in these patients. Finally, uh, reflexes uh, should also be checked. The tendon reflexes are uh, exaggerated in pyramidal tract disease while uh, they are uh, diminished or absent in uh, root or uh, peripheral nerve disorder. So the thumb rule is that uh, peripheral vestibular disorders cause abnormal uh, vestibular ocular reflex and they spare the other eye movements. While central disorders can cause abnormal pursuit, abnormal VOR suppression, saccades, with or without VOR problems. So my take home message at the end would be, you have all the sophisticated equipment at hand of VNG, V8, VMC, COG, whatever. But 
it is your clinical acumen that was that is going to always help you arrive at a correct diagnosis thank you very much stay home stay safe thank you sir thank you thank you very thank you much very for much. the presentation it was uh, comprehensive indeed and uh, the take home message is well taken sir thank you thank you dr srinivas now uh, we are, we will go ahead with the case presentation sure. so i invite uh, uh, dr uh, vijay ghuge uh, he is a uh, um, a neurologist, uh, uh, senior neurologist practicing in uh, uh, Nashik. Okay, so he specializes. He has a special interest in vertigo and headache. He uh, did his uh, MBBS from uh, St. G. S. Medical College and K. M. Hospital, Mumbai. He did the uh, M. D. Medicine from uh, L. T. M. M. C. and Sion Hospital, Mumbai. Then he went on to complete his uh, D. M. Uh, in uh, neurology uh, from Maulana Azad Medical College and G. B. Panth Hospital, New Delhi. He has a current practice, uh, which is Vishwanath Neuro and uh, ENT Care. Okay, his wife uh, is a neuro uh, uh, is an ENT, so they have a neuro and ENT under uh, in one family. Okay, so I now request uh, Dr. Vijay Guge to uh, kindly take over and uh, present the case. Dr. Guge, sir, you can start sharing the screen. Yes, sir. Yes. Am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. You are audible. Yes, sir. We can see the slides. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for kind introduction, sir, and giving me this opportunity. Uh, this is 80 year old male uh, gentleman presented uh, uh, his symptomatic since last three months. He had a recurrent episode of sudden vertiginous sensation associated with unresponsiveness lasting one to two minutes with associated grunting of the sound and slight uprolling of the eyeball without any posturing of the limb. He had a multiple episode in last uh, three months. The frequency of episode ranges from one to two per day to one per week. There is no history of any confusion post episode. Uh, amnesia of episode, slight amnesia is present. All episodes are spontaneous without any postural variation. And there is no specific triggers for the episode according to the patient. So when he first visited me on the basis of the above clinical history, the provisional diagnosis of syncope versus late onset seizure was made. In his clinical examination, his pulse was 82 per minute uh, regular. BP is 132 by 78 in supine. On standing three minutes, 126 by 70, and there was no postural drop in the patient. Rest of the neurological examination is quite fine for his age. He was already admitted with similar complaint, uh, with similar complaint with some physician, and uh, he came with the record of 2D echo and ECG and then both were normal. So MRI brain was done and EEG was done at my center and both were normal. So on the basis of the clinical history and his medical record, uh, his ECG was normal, 2D echo was normal, everything was fine. And uh, MRI EEG uh, was also normal. He was started empirically on levetiracetam 500 milligram twice daily. But there was no response to the treatment and uh, he continues to get this episode. So I have called the patient for the VNG. And while doing the VNG, patient developed the similar episode. Uh, thankfully, I'm lucky. Yeah, I was there and uh, I have documented the episode in the clinic. And this is the video while doing horizontal OK. Last five to six, sec seven to eight seconds of the uh, uh, this video are very important. This is right, uh, stimulus from right to left on OK. Uh, initially, patient is having right beating nystagmus, but uh, that is then converted into abnormal form.
this is right pitting nystagmus basically on right to left oken stimulation horizontal now the nystagmus direction will change it is now right and down beating right and down beating at the end you will get profound down beating nystagmus so this were the vng tracing and if you look here uh, you will find uh, at the 20, 28 to 30 second there is starting of the down beating nystagmus initially along with the right beating nystagmus and the documented episode was the while sitting in the chair patient suddenly started fainting episode grunting sound and almost fell from the chair the episode was typical of syncope the patient's pulse was not palpable bp was not recordable and patient's so patient's leg were lifted uh, since bp and pulse was not uh, documented after about 1 to 2 minute patient start responding and started recognizing the relative so this was a typical ect and on the basis of old background eeg normal mri normal not looking like a typical of uh, seizure so ect was done in my clinic immediately after the fainting episode and that ecg is showing severe bradycardia and patient's heart rate was 37 per minute this is sinus bradycardia basically so patient is shifted just uh, 100 meters from my clinic there is a cardiac uh, one of the renowned cardiac center in nasik city and uh, when i shifted there patient's heart rate was absolutely normal 69 per minute and uh, his ecg was also normalized and his ecg is suggestive of right bundle branch block and nothing else after few minutes now his uh, his uh, monitor is showing heart rate of 39 per minute after few uh, at that time his ecg was documented in that institution and uh, that heart rate is around 35 per minute so patient is having intermittent bradycardia so the on the basis of the clinical history patient was investigated through regularly and uh, his uh, thyroid function was normal potassium was normal magnesium normal calcium normal since he is 84 year old and he is having intermittent bradycardia so the final diagnosis of sick sinus syndrome with episodic sinus bradycardia with syncopal episode and fall was made patient was go ahead with a pacemaker implantation and uh, after the dual chamber pacemaker implantation and after that on follow up patient uh, didn't have any uh, further episode in the last two months so this is after post uh, pacemaker implantation ecg absolutely normal so the take home message from this case is that uh, always check for the ecg and orthostatic uh, hypotension in old age patient try to get the uh, try to get 24 hour holter monitoring in such patient uh, sometimes only ictal that is during the episode investigations are required and that will give you the accurate information remember every case of vertigo is not a vestibular disorder sometimes we have to think out of the box thank you sir ultimate case sir thank you so much sir thank you so much sir thank you thank you so now we will uh, have the presentation from dr henry sir shrinivas sir yeah dr henry uh, is a senior ent surgeon from shillong so he uh, he is a head and neck trained person but uh, he started taking special interest in neurotology too um uh, my uh, and he's also has keen interest in lot of travel wildlife photography his photographs are one of among the best i now request uh, dr henry to uh, present his case 
सर यू कैन स्टार्ट सर हेनरी सर हेनरी सर यू कैन स्टार्ट सर यू कैन हियर मी यस सर वी कैन हियर यू सर वी कैन हियर यू सर ओके ओके या so Start. good evening everybody mm, happy birthday niranjan sir and thank you uh, cyclops team for such a wonderful program here uh, yeah so what i'm going to present is on uh, a bppv which uh, presented at typically in my opd um, this is a 40 year old uh, lady she had a history of a fall in the winter of 2018 when sitting warming up in the chula so this is the kind of chula we use yeah we use these kind of chulas to warm up herself you know we sit in the evening around this to warm up herself because it's quite cold here so she uh, one evening she fell down and had a second degree burn on her face uh, there was no history of unconsciousness lost consciousness or seizure Uh, she was even uh, then seen by a physician who thought that it would could be a probably a carbon monoxide uh, toxicity uh, then she was sent home but later in the, in the coming days she came to me saying that uh, she has uh, episodes of giddiness especially on turning in the bed and on get, getting up from bed uh, and most uh, most of the time symptom was on right side so i had examined her and uh, there was no spontaneous nystagmus and gait stepping tests all these were normal the ears were normal so i did a, a vng and uh, let me know if the vng doesn't show but i go, i hope it shows so you see that the vng this is a dick's hall pike on the right hand side so we cannot see the video i think we cannot see the video okay no problem uh, yeah so i think yesterday when we did the dry, dry run it was fine sir so just check yeah it was fine yeah yeah now i think you can see no you can have you to go to sir you will uh, have to you will have to minimize this uh, uh, powerpoint presentation to play the video probably but it played yeah, within sir, ppt I yeah i have minimized the thing still your ppt is showing okay. little more okay. now can you see the video now okay yeah. no can you so go back to the... sir you have to close this uh, uh, this uh, uh, browser window i mean not the browser i mean the uh, whatever you call this folder view folder folder okay folder view whatever i think is trying to play the video separately i'm playing the video separately sir yeah that is there but you, uh, as long as this is there in zoom this will be covered this will be covering that oh my the, god the three hat screens the position the the things that are seen that is showing up so you'll have to please close this the okay this one i have to close yeah yeah now no 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 sir still that is seen so the 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 file explorer window you have to close sir file explorer window file explorer if i if i close this yeah. okay ah now you can play that you play that and you close the file explorer you do alt tab and close the file file explorer uh now you are not seeing anything yeah share your screen sir can you now you are not sharing can you your see screen. now you are not sharing the screen sir please share your screen i am not sharing my screen i was sharing actually okay can you see the screen now yes sir yes sir we can see okay just check it the video is seen now no no you have to go to slide show mode first and then click
Yeah, just wait. I think it will play. Yeah. Uh, click where? Because it's hyperlink. So go to slideshow mode. Okay. Yeah, click, click. Can you yeah. see now? Yeah, just say okay. Yeah, is the video? Yeah, just say okay. Just click okay. I think what what we are seeing and what he is seeing is totally different. Yeah, I think now it will play. Now I think something is playing. We'll see. <laughs> oh my goodness! Is it playing now? Is the video seen? No, sir. <clears throat> no. Pratik, Pratik, do you have the video, sir? Uh, this presentation on copy with you? No, sir. No, sir. Uh, video, sir. I have the video. You have the video. I have the video, sir. Yeah, then you can play. In that case, Henry, sir, will have to stop sharing. No. Yeah. I think, sir, we will take some questions and then. Uh, No, let the case get over. See, let him finish the case. Let him finish the uh, case. But the case without uh, the yeah. case without the video will not look good, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I'll ask uh, if Pratik. Okay, okay. The... I'll, I'll do one thing. Uh, okay, but then you can't see the video, right? Uh, let me uh, uh, try this. Uh... Can you see the video now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Is the video see. playing? Yeah, it's okay. playing. It's playing. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, I think I, I think I got a way out. Okay, now okay. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, let me uh, think. I'll, 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 show, I'll, I'll share this way. Yes. Uh, so yeah, on on the twin on the on. Uh, so she had this fall. You can see the thing. No? Uh, so she had this fall, and uh, I did. The VNG on the first episode of uh, on the first visit. So this was the first. Or this was in the, uh, Can you see the video now? No, it briefly came and went off. It's now again showing the Explorer screen. You have to minimize this. You double click on the video. And then you. Uh, I think you want to try playing it from your end. Sir, I will not. I am not able. I will not able to explain the exact scenario, na, sir. I can you play. Just play the video. Oh. You just play the video. After that, again, sir, will go. Sir, will do it. You just play the video, and then afterwards, again, sir, will take. Kiki, I said I'm on the phone, Kiki. Pratik, are you trying to play? Pratik? I am searching the video, sir. So in this case, let, let Dr. Hindi try again. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please try. Sir. Yeah. You, you, you let him know when, if you, if by, the, by chance, you get the video. Correct video. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Hindi, sir. 
I think you can restart sharing and uh, carry on, sir. Try, sir, one more time. Okay. One more thing you can do is you can leave the meeting and rejoin. Then it will work. Okay, I'll leave the meeting and rejoin. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Pradeek, till Dr. Henry comes back, maybe you want to just uh, start. Uh, he has uh, come back. He has come back. You need to make him panelist. He has come back. Okay. One second. Okay. Sir, I got the video, sir. You can start screen sharing and play it off. Uh, by then, uh, Dr. Henry will. Okay, sir. Can you see the video? Yep. So this was the Dick Solpike left, and uh, there was no particular movement, no nystagmus. But when we did a Dixol Pike right side, we can see a torsional movement. You can see the videos, no? We can see the videos, but the nystagmus uh, is not appreciable. I think there is some compression happening. Ah, yes, sir. So, so I, think, I think it's the other video. I think it's not the the one, the video which I wanted to show. So which one do you want, sir? Open test, this okay, one? Which, uh, which date is this? Sir, 10th July. 10th July. Okay, 10th 10, 10 of July, it's only Maclear, which was... Uh, okay, can, okay, we will do one thing. I will just, I will just narrate. Yes, sir. Uh, can you go back? Let me see Daddy. which video is here. Daddy. Uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just show the video. Can you go back to the videos? Uh, okay. So, let me see what I can narrate from... This is showing torsional list Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, okay, can can we minimize this video? Yes, sir. Yeah. So now coming back to the case. So she uh, uh, she had a fall, as I told you, and uh, and she had a facial burn, and uh, all the, all the clinical examinations negative, and we did the VNG on uh, on doing the VNG on the that. Uh, can you open the uh, the folder to, uh, on the January? Mm. Right, this is right, yeah. January, uh, January folder. Can you go back, back on the thing? Yeah, January 20th, 20th January, 20th January. Yeah, and please go to right, uh, right Dick's Hall Pike. Right, yes. right Dick's Hall Pike. Yes, yeah. 
please play the video yeah yeah so you, you see this is the right uh, right dex hall pike and you would notice that uh, say after uh, on turning and after a few minutes of a uh, few seconds of latency you see a, a torsional stiffness uh, as you get uh, yes and in, in a dex in a dex hall pike yes this way they yeah. Up, up beating the stagmus uh, that you would get in the right dex hall pike whether well, was it seen properly yes sir we can see sir it's a torsional yeah. up beating the stagmus and yes, the upper pull is beating so the yeah and uh, and if you do the the maclear pagnini uh, if you, yeah on the same day yeah on the same day the maclear pagnini there also you'd see a, a torsional nystagmus uh, if you go yeah little nothing yeah fast a little bit take a little bit first yeah okay i think they you see Ah uh, yes, sir. Okay, then uh, yeah. So this was a torsional dysmagnus. We see in macular pagnini again. So um, on this first visit, it was a, was was almost a clear cut case of a post uh, right uh, posterior canal BPPB. So I did a Eplace maneuver uh, in this uh, in this um, first visit. So patient was okay. We sent her home. She was fine. Uh, since she was working in her own hospital, she was taking lightly because she would see me anytime. So. But she never complained much. But sometimes she'll say, "I still have the giddiness um, uh, occasionally." So she was quiet. She would think that it was okay. What I go. So she had disappeared for many months, and then one day, after six months following this, she had come to, she had come to the OPD again, and I mean, so she came to the emergency with a severe attack of uh, what I go. So she came with a very severe attack of what I go, and then uh, then I took her again for a, a clinical examination. So she was fine. Uh, all clinical examinations are okay. So I did a VNG again on this on the second time. So on the second time, uh, since the video is not playing, so I would just directly narrate that uh, yeah, the Dix Hall Pike in the second instance um, uh, was uh, was negative. I mean, I could not elicit any nystagmus. Can you open? Yeah, open that folder, please, Molin. Yeah, open that. Yeah, and on the tenth, tenth July, tenth July, yeah, tenth July. So during this uh, during this episode. Uh, I did. I did all the clinical tests and uh, even the Dix Hall Pike. So Dix Hall Pike on both sides was negative. So and I uh, yeah. So it's no use to play the Dix Hall Pike because there was no no nystagmus was elicited in the Dix Hall Pike test. But if you open the macular pagnini test, please open the macular pagnini. Yeah. So the macular macular pagnini test, uh, we could elicit the nystagmus. It was a torsional nystagmus on turning the head to the right side. Can you forward the minute to about uh, 20 seconds? Yeah, a little bit yeah, before that, slightly before that. Yeah. Uh, then uh, we turned the head to the right side and then she started uh, getting these uh, nystagmus. Okay, forward a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we started getting, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, then you started getting these, uh, these root, uh, torsional nystagmus. So looking at this, uh, this is a second episode that she had and uh, Dick's whole bike was negative and we got only on, on, on turning the head to the right side. Yeah, we can close the video now. So uh, so it could have been, uh, you know, because of the torsional upbeating kind uh, and, and on turning to the right side. So I did both the maneuver for her. I combined uh, Dick's uh, uh, place maneuver and a uh, Gufoni man uh, maneuver for the right, uh, for right horizontal canal BPPB. So following this, uh, following this, yeah, I can close the video now. Yes. Yeah. Following this, yeah. Following this, she was uh, she was better. She she never complained again after that. So in uh, since it was uh, since it was also a second time, uh, yeah, what I go and intermittently she had so uh, and as a recurring recurring uh, BPPV. So keeping in mind of vestibular migraine, I had uh, kept her on uh, on flunarazine as well. So and she, she had gone home and then everything was fine. Uh, we would meet, but then she would never complain of anything. So it went on like this. And she never she never told me anything about this, uh, her problem, though we meet in the hospital. It was only after six months, that was very recently, that uh, I happened to go to her to the office and met her. Then uh, then I was, I was just uh, casually asking her, how is that? She said, no, there's no problem. Sometimes she hears what I go. But she says she has... You know, the, the, uh, this, this time she had a very weird complaint. She said that okay, there, there was a time when she had injured every time she bends down. You know, she I, she was about to pick up something when I noticed she was about to pick up something. But then 
she was picking up the the pen in a very odd way she was uh, she was scared to bend down i said why are you scared to bend down she said no if i bend down i'll fall then she said uh, then i said since when has this uh, began who said no this has begun uh, from the time when uh you know she uh, she bent down once and she fell down and she injured her face so i said how many times she had uh, f- uh, she had fallen several times uh, like this whenever she bends down when try she tries to pick up something she falls down and hits something in the face and she gets a uh, you know as a abrasion can well thing in in the face yeah. please please stop this video yeah because it's yeah yeah just stop yeah uh yeah uh so and i told no this is the, then she had seen a neurologist during her first fall so please stop the video 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 yeah yeah <laughs> please stop the video <laughs> yeah no. so uh she had seen a neurologist uh, at that time uh and they had taken her to be a seizure disorder so they had started her an, an, an antiepileptic but at times she would also have headaches uh, sometimes so uh, she had stopped flunazine after two months or so after taking after the second uh, second uh, meeting so she stopped but in intermittently whenever she has a headache she would take flunazine but she would continue antiepileptics and then at this time i said no it doesn't sound like a thing it looks like a more of vestibular so i took her back uh, to examine and then i did her vng again can you open the bng on uh, 10 january 2020 yeah 220 yeah so i will okay i will just um, probably i will not play any of the video because since they're not playing so i will just uh, brief them that all of them were negative so i could not elicit nystagmus neither on um, on dick's hall pike nor on uh, on macular pregnancy but there were only complaints that she had giddiness when i was doing uh, when i was doing the dick's hall pike she would complain of uh, vertigo but she didn't have nystagmus except for flickering of the uh, of the eyelids so that was on both macular and uh, pagnity so i uh, had recorded her fall now can you go back uh, the video go back go back the folder go back to the folder go back back the folder yeah so then i i uh, yeah then i uh, check her yeah please open this video this one sir yeah uh, so i gobbled her eyes and ask her to bend down i want to uh, see what how she what happens when she bends down so you'll see when she bends down she falls forward that was what what was happening to her so this is happening so when bending uh, when standing she cannot bend and even this you'd see when sitting when she tries to pick up something so when she tries to bend down she tries to pick up she completely lose balance and she falls and she hits her head anyway and in every way so we did that both with sitting and standing and she was behaving the same so he said no probably because you covered my eyes so that's why i'm falling so i said okay fine i'll i'll uh, i'll let you uh, you know uh, i'll give you your vision and we will do the test can you play please play the next video yeah this time i took off the eye shades and did and and, and did the test but uh, and she fell down the same way so when I, whenever she bends down she would just fall so she would not be able to balance but during this uh, i was monitoring her vng at the same time but uh, there was no uh, nystagmus being elicited in both instances so taking in consideration that uh, previously she had a uh, right posterior canal ppvv so we treated her as a posterior canal ppvv so we did uh, two uh, two maneuver for her yeah we uh, yeah we did two maneuver for her uh, can we uh, now i would like uh, i will not show what i had done but i would show what uh, what dr sinivas had asked me to do these are the these are the two uh, two uh, maneuvers which i had done for the patient taking a, a diagnosis to be preliminary as a uh, as a posterior canal bpvv so this is the stroops modified simons maneuver and the meca maneuver which i had done so can you please uh, yeah yeah this this is on the previous one yes previous one yeah 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 yes this one so this is the this is the stroops modified yeah this is stroops modified yeah i would like everybody to hear uh, to hear what dr sivas uh, mentioned because this is interesting so please yeah so 
So the head was hyper extended, unlike the normally what we do for Simol maneuver. Here the head was hyper extended and kept there. I kept there for about two minutes. Then the patient was very stable. And then quickly flip her to the other side. So this was the maneuver I did. This is uh, taking consideration that it is a right posterior canal. Uh, Autoconia. Uh, yeah. Then the next, the next maneuver which I incorporated for this uh, for this patient is the is what is called the Mecca maneuver. The Mecca maneuver. You ask the patient to bow forward. And quickly stand and return that position. Yes, sir. Okay, now now I can share my screen. Yes, sir. So please. please. <laughs> sir, those videos that I had made was, was for yes, personal sir? use. You have yes, broadcast sir, I, I have to broadcast it because it is it is very useful and it is has been so effective. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, Pratik, can you please uh, can you please show the video again? I want to show the video after one month after recovery. Sir, uh, you have yeah. to, I think, you have to you have to stop uh, stop sharing, sir. You have to stop yes, sharing. yes, I am doing that. Yes. So now you can. Uh... Okay. Uh... You can play that video from your end also. Just minimize this. Uh, just minimize this PowerPoint like half of the screen, sir. Okay, I'm minimize half the screen, but I'm not able to link it. That's the only thing because all hyperlink. Okay. All all hyperlink. So please play it from your end. Okay, sir. Uh, stop your sharing, sir. Sir, you will have to stop sharing, sir. <laughs> I'm not able to access that. I have to, I have to move, move the forward. cursor upward. Move the cursor upward, sir. You can see a green. I think now oh, this. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Yes. Sir. So yeah, I repeat, I re check the patient again after. Yeah. I think this is the video. The last one, the last, the last video. No, no, not this, not this, not this. Which one, sir? Not this, yeah. Uh, bottom, but a bit after that. Yes, this is the video. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is the the, the result of this maneuver one month after the after after done. So you see the patient is happy, giving a thumbs up. She could uh, easily do it. Now she can bend forward. Okay. So she she there, there's happy. no more fall. Yeah. So she is very happy. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I've done that both on standing and when sitting. Okay, this, this was a thing when, yeah, she was still scared. Uh, so I repeated her, asked her to look down and pick up. So she's able to do this. Yeah, yeah. you can close this video now, sir. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll start sharing my screen now. So now coming to the discussion of this case, we finally diagnosed it as a as a posterior canal BPPV. But what would be the cause of recurrence in this case? So there are a few uh, causes that we can think of. One is would be the stricture in the canal, some developmental deformity of the canal, or some residual autoconia somewhere in the common crust. And there's a, also a possibility of the autoconia in the opposite side of the uh, utricular end of the opposite of the left um, posterior canal or in the, uh, somewhere in the short arm. Therefore, that uh, therefore the Mecca maneuver was done for that purpose. Also, because it is a recurrent vertigo and a positional vertigo, we kept in mind of vestibular migraine. So she was uh, also advised to take um, flunarazine for that. 
but uh, why would you consider the fall forward when bending? So the probable result, uh, reason for this was probably a very intense Laplantine stimulation, which was causing that false perception of movement and uh, cause, uh, triggering a short latency uh, vestibular spinal posterior reflex. Uh, so finally, we had these diagnosis, be post recurrent post canal BPPD. Uh, vestibular could be associated with vestibular migraine, but still we kept a uh, possibility of vest uh, vestibular proxemia or cross compression syndrome, for which we are still observing. Till now, the patient is fine. So in case he still has further things, so probably we would think of an MRI. What's happening now? Okay. So yeah, the treatment for, for these recurrent uh, posterior canal, generally we would uh, recommend a post uh, a plane maneuver or a Simon maneuver. Uh, what we have done, what the two maneuver we have done is probably an unpublished uh, maneuvers, but uh, I think Sir must have learned it from, from the master himself. And so he showed me how to do those maneuver, but probably those two maneuvers are yet uh, yet to be published. But what is published is all for, for posterior uh, recurrent um, posterior canal PPV is what is known as a ha half somersault. Uh, in half somersault, uh, there are advantages. Uh, this, there are disadvantage to the air place. We will see what, what are the advantages and disadvantages of this. Uh, half somersault, what you do is you ask the patient first to look upwards. For, then after that, then direct uh, quickly bend in a somersault position and stay there for, for some time. And then gradually turn the head, suppose saying it's a right, right posterior canal BPP, turn the head to the right post, uh, right arm, to the right elbow, turn the arm, uh, the, the face to the uh, right elbow, and then stay there till, till she experiences no more uh, giddiness. So you would see the corresponding say if the autoconia was somewhere here, on bending forward, you would see the autonia would slip down and come towards the to uh, the to, to towards the, the common crust, and then as the patient uh, uh, once you turn the head to, uh, to the right, and then you ask uh, the patient to with in the in the position which is uh, retaining the position to spring straight upward, keeping the head and the shoulder the the scapula and the uh, straight, so that way it would bring the autoconia further into the towards the common crest and then after the after about a minute you can ask the patient to lift the uh, head upward main, maintaining the uh, vision towards the uh, right uh, right arm so that way that would push the uh, autoconia back into the utricle so let's see what are the what are the advantage and disadvantage of uh, this half some more salt so uh, if you compare the result of a half somersault and air place, you would say they have seen that the result was much better with the uh, with air place. But the only reason why uh, air place uh, has its drawback is that when you do the air place maneuver, there is a chance that, uh, that the vertigo is more intense during the head changing, uh, during the head positions. And secondly, is that there's a chance that these autoconia miss uh, get ref uh, ref uh, may reflux into the horizontal canal. So if in a clinical situation, we would know how to handle, if it, uh, if it reflects into the horizontal canal, we would again do a uh, maneuver to uh, repose the, the, the auto, autoconia back to your trickle. But a patient at home will not know how to do that. So uh, half somersault, the first advantage is that the vertigo is less compared to uh, air place uh, when doing at home, is very less. So they will not have that fear. There will be no assistance required. They will not have to learn or they won't have to know because of the, how to maneuver uh, horizontal canal because the chance of, uh, of autoconia refluxing into the horizontal canal with this half somersault is very, very, very negligible. So it's very effective doing at home, though, it's, though the result is less effective than a place, but they can do this maneuver more frequently at home because they're less vertigo and they don't have to bother about the uh, horizontal canal part. So they have, uh, so as a home exercises, this can be recommended because it has shown to, uh, to show better results in terms of recurrence. But uh, again, like any other maneuver, they have the limitation like a knee injury or head back injury or excessive heavy weight people, uh, obese people or who's who has an uh, impaired flexibility of the body. So these are a few limitations. So uh, the other alternate um, uh, treatment are these, yet uh, they're yet to be published. So. With that, I would like to thank the whole team and all the participants. 
thank you so much sir for this wonderful uh, presentation sir it's very typical and the nystagmus is also very typical we have lots of question now sir yeah pratik i, I request dr pratik and uh, uh, swarup to take over the moderation of the question answer session there are lot of questions there yes sir yes sir so we will start from dr solar ma'am dr solar ma'am are you here yes 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 ma'am so the first question is from dr manoj a mm -hmm. diabetic patient with dizziness and peripheral neuropathy affecting mm -hmm. the sensation of lower limbs especially the soles so could that affect your uh, cdp that uh, posturography well um it does but let me tell you the the benefit of it is the fact that we always ask the patient to do this uh, condition number 1 so we're actually comparing him to himself when we're getting the sensory organization uh, values so what we are doing is comparing him standing still in the first condition in comparison to the different condition in cases of a uh, uh, patient with diabetes yes we will see lower score but also because it's a ratio uh, i believe that the, it's not as affected as the, the ratios are not as affected because we are comparing them to a station's uh, condition condition number 1 i hope i answered his question yes ma'am thank you ma'am uh, dr vishal is asking what is the difference between disequilibrium and ataxia okay so um in in general uh, the disequilibrium is when you are seeing the cases in static position and uh, in ataxia no it's when we have a failure um, to to failure or we are falling in cases of um, when we have a uh, movement so there is a difference definitely between ataxia and disequilibrium now i always get this question what do we consider cdp are we considering them as ataxic or disequilibrium and i would say cons i consider cdp similar to uh, the fukuda data where they are uh, you cannot use one term you need it, it it is a complex movement but at the same time they're static so there is no correct answer for it okay. sorry uh, no ma'am uh, dr maxim from ukraine is asking that mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about y balance board and soft foam for posturography and rehabilitation because cdp mm -hmm. is very expensive tool and it is not uh, available across the world i understand so for me uh, there are few uh, we um, um, softwares let's put it, games if you want that have been shown in study especially in austria and in the us where specific games let's put it or specific, specific softwares and have been correlated with cdp so i would say i understand that not everyone can afford to get a post computerized dynamic posturography but my recommendation would be to follow the uh, the um, protocols that have been published to be useful don't just um, rely on things that are posted only online follow uh, what are the centers that were able to do test on a real computerized dynamic posturography compare it to the we and what are what changes were done to the we because i know for sure that they had to do some changes on the surrounding for the we so please take care of that yes ma'am ma'am what is the youngest stage that uh, in that we can perform cdp youngest age well the the issue is not the age the issue is the weight because okay. the platform needs a minimum of uh, we were at 17 kilos now we're at 12 personally the youngest i was able to do was at 3 years and a half okay thank you ma'am sure. yes i think uh, questions for you are over ma'am <laughs> thank you yes sir. thank you so much thank for you for that. thank you and i want to say that the both cases were very interesting and i want to thank the physical exam lecture it was uh, refreshing thank you so much for giving me the chance thank you so much ma'am talk uh so uh, dr avinash sir we have a uh, few questions for you also yeah i can hear you yes sir the so first question is from dr shatish how rapid is the stepping in fukuda test uh well uh, i mean uh, i'll not be able to give you a measurement for it but well it has to be uh, as fast as possible depending upon the cap capability of the patient and his age yes sir right and sir uh, should we do the rombergs uh, and the attenberger with footwear on or barefoot 
this is from See, dr initially Lee. it should be barefoot i think because then you are uh, also checking the proprioceptive inputs so uh, and ultimately you are making the patient stand on uh, foam also towards the end of the test so barefoot is fine i think yes sir uh, sir uh, dr mai l gahazili uh, is asking does vertical nystagmus that disappears with fixation exclude central lesion uh no because you see uh, by and large we say generally the uh, nystagmus that uh, increases with uh, i mean or rather does not disappear or does not diminish with fixation or the other way uh, around uh, is uh, not a central origin but then uh, if you uh, ask me the maximum number of uh, nystagmus that i have been able to elicit is by removal of fixation okay sir uh dr maxim from ukraine is asking what do you prescribe in case of central positional nystagmus with negative brain mri well honestly i'm not a neurologist uh, and uh, i would be referring such cases to a neurologist being an ent surgeon uh, but uh, if i'm not wrong i think uh, they use aminopyridine uh, for yes. this i'm not sure yes sir for aminopyridine yes yeah for aminopyridine it's a trial drug sir uh, dr sagar is asking uh, can you please explain difference between positional and positioning vertigo yeah well basically practically speaking there is not much of a difference uh, uh, practically but then when you say positional nystagmus you are uh, putting the head from one static position into another static position right mm. so this is basically a static test static test and this nystagmus persists as long as the head is kept in the new static position so that is positional now coming to positioning positioning test actually refers mostly to tests where uh, the uh, head is brought about dynamically from one position to another and the nystagmus does not uh, it appears on bringing the head to a new position and it does not persist it fades away yes sir Uh, uh, pushpanjali ma'am is asking about how to do vertebral artery test and uh, uh, dr rohi rohiwal is asking uh, have you did the vertebral artery testing before you do a dixol pipe or uh, are you doing well, i'll answer both the questions together one is uh, it's a very simple procedure i think you can uh, people can see me on the screen okay yes sir so i'll just tell you so turn the neck to one side for about 20 to 30 seconds and if the patient develops a nystagmus you can suspect a lack of blood flow on the opposite side okay yes sir. so that's exactly how you do it yes sir the first part answered the yes. second part dr rohiwal so actually uh, to be honest i don't do it in every case of dixol pipe but when i see that this patient has a rigid neck or uh, i suspect something so when i'm a bit scared to go ahead with the extreme positions that we uh, do in dixol pipe Yes, I started doing it off late. Yes, sir. Uh, so, last question from uh, Dr. Pushpanjali, ma'am. Uh, are there is there any relation with transient ischemic uh, attacks and hearing test? Yeah. Or... Basically, what happens is that these transient ischemic attacks uh, they rarely uh, occur solo with uh, vertigo alone as uh, you know the problem. But uh, as I said uh, at some time during my talk, that uh, the most uh, common complaint of the patient unless you explore further in the history is that of vertigo because that's the most distressing symptom for the patient so yes. you should probe for hearing loss in cases of uh, tia where you're suspecting tia looking at the age of the patient cardiovascular risk factors in the patient so uh, basically uh, these last less than an hour and uh, if the patient uh, keeps on getting these transient ischemic attacks by the time he has had four to six of these attacks he might land up in the icu with a stroke so if you have been able to diagnose him properly with a hearing loss associated with the vertigo it's more likely to be tia of course there are other things like uh, you know checking for diplopia etc also because vertigo alone usually by and large commonly does not occur alone in cases of tia thank you so much sir thank you sir uh now we have a few questions Swarup? for dr goge swarup swarup ha swarup uh, yes sir swarup 
Yes, sir. Sir, Sorup is asking some questions. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll see. Uh, now, uh, uh, how do we assess people with cognitive impairments? It's asked by Dr. Aishwarya, I think so. People with? Is that how a question do, for me? Yeah, uh, I don't know. It's uh, how do we assess people with cognitive impairments? Well, I don't think that's a question for me. Yeah, I think. Uh, because that would uh, be a more of a fit question for Dr. Solara. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah. Other questions? Uh, Pratik sir, uh, you just see how much questions you have asked. Actually, I, I joined a little bit later. Okay, okay, okay. Then okay. I will ask. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, sir. Yes, sir, please. Oh, okay, sir. See, by uh, then, Dr. Pratik will continue. Maybe yes, in the meanwhile, you can pick up the questions. Yes, yeah, yeah. Sir, uh, now we have questions for Dr. Guge. Guge, sir? Guge, sir, are you here? I think I think Guge sir has dropped out. Okay, okay. okay. So, uh, Doctor Henry sir, we have lots of questions for you. Henry sir. Yeah, almost all the questions are for Doctor Henry only. <laughs> yes, sir. Beautiful questions are there, sir. Henry sir, are you here? Sir, uh, uh, Shrinivas, yeah, okay. sir. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'm here, I'm here, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, there First is a question. Time. Yes, sir. There is a question. How much of swaying is clinically considered abnormal in Romberg's test? It's related to general examination and all. How much of in Romberg's, in Romberg's test? Yes, sir. How much of sway is clinically no, abnormal, sir? Well, how much I cannot, I, I am I'm really sorry to tell how much, but yeah, I would look for a gross swing from the normal. I mean, I mean there, there's nothing like normal or thing, but I just would look for a really gross swing. Can gross I swing. interrupt here, Dr. Henry? Yeah. See, yes. basically, uh, it is not the sway because a normal person also in Romberg is expected to sway, particularly in the sharpened Romberg. Uh, it's the tendency to fall that is important. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, sir uh, <clears throat> yeah, Dr. Vishal okay. is asking about uh, what was cervical imaging done and uh, he thinks that it is the attack would be due to CV junction anomaly, sir. So yeah, what we, uh, no, we, we, had not, uh, we did not do any, uh, any imaging for her. Uh, there's no obvious reason why I didn't do. Uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, CV junction wasn't done yet yeah, because when she had the first fall, a CT was done by the neurologist. Okay, so only a CD was done. That was all. Uh, when uh, when I when she had seen me, uh, that time we I had asked for uh, MRI, but she she uh, refuses to do an MRI. Okay, uh, Doctor Neeraj is asking if you are doubting Dr. about Pratik, vestibular paralysis. Doctor Pratik, Dr. Pratik. Yes, sir. Just one minute. Okay, I will uh, I will announce the topics for the next week, and then after that we can carry on with the questions. Okay. Yes, sir. The next week we are starting again at 4:30. Okay, so 24th April 2020. Uh, so we are having uh, Dr. Manoj Agarwal. Uh, he'll be speaking on insights into the gross gross vestibular anatomy through dissection. So we'll get a proper understanding of the all the orientation of different areas through a, a dissection approach. See, all the time we have been taking a different kind of approach, sections and all those things. This is a dissection approach. So totally new way of looking it uh, into the uh, inner ear. So insights into the gross vestibular anatomy through dissection. Then Dr. Hitesh Patel, okay, this is a star lecture which I always like. Uh, that is a uh, uh, history taking in vestibular assessment. Uh, he gives a lot of syndromic approach uh, just on history basis. So that is something. Okay. Then uh, Dr. Sujit Sinha from uh, Aish Mysore, he is going to be making a case presentation. That is auditory neuropathy with ataxia. Okay. So next uh, week, 4:30, same time. Excellent topics for next time. Yeah, so coming back to the scan, so basically the uh, patient refused to get her MRI even after I think so she's still on follow up because since you're in the hospital uh, staff herself, so she keep on seeing, but every time she sees me, please don't ask, don't ask me to do MRI. So she's really scared of injections. That was only the reason why you're still waiting. When will she ever need one? <laughs> okay. Okay, so she's afraid of contrast uh, and uh, yes, yes, definitely. Yes, yeah. <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> Sir, Dr. Neeraj is asking, if you are doubting about vestibular paroxysmia, why did you not try hyperventilation? Okay. Or uh, right? Yeah. Uh, I have done all the tests in the panel of uh, uh, on VNG panel, so all the tests have been done. Uh, all, all, everything right from um, the vertical, subjective vertical, everything, uh, everything. hyperventilation, so it was negative. Uh, everything was negative, except what you saw was during when we did, did the maneuver. That's the Dick Holpike and the Macleo, where she did complain of giddiness, but. There was no monostagmus except for flickering of the uh, of the eyelids. That was all. Eyelids. Yeah. Okay. That was the last. That, that was the last uh, visit. Last visit. Okay. Yeah. Sir, uh, there is a question from Doctor Vaidish Bhatt. Can half somersault somersault maneuver be, be practiced by patient himself at home without any supervision, or what are your views on that, sir? Okay. Uh, of late, uh, the half somersault is the most uh, advised. Uh, home practice for patient. There are uh, three, uh, two, three reasons to it. Uh, first, it is, it is practically easy to do it. It does not need any assistance. The patient does not need to learn how to do a corrective maneuver for horizontal canal, BPPV. So it's an easy, uh, there's comparatively, there is lesser, mm, lesser vertigo uh, compared to a place maneuver. And the, though, if you look at efficacy wise, uh, there, there have been study which shows that uh, the efficacy of um, uh, of rec uh, the, the rate of recurrence uh, with um, uh, following BPPV at home uh, mm. is about thirty five uh, percent recurrence with uh, with uh, uh, with this uh, what do you call it? A place and lesser with the uh, thing recurrences. The, 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 the reason for this recurrence is the, the, the recurrence is more being with the uh, a place and lesser with the uh, with the half somersault is that since it's lesser vertiginous procedure, the patient can do several times and uh, without the fear. So they, they, it's more it's more effective. So it reduces the recurrences uh, recurrence rate. Okay, so so it's, it's it's very practical to use it at home. Yes. So earlier we used to say that you can do blender of exercises at home. So now we can uh, ask patients to do this half some assault also for yes. posterior canal only. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So, I saw one more question whether it's an, uh, there's one question which I think, uh, which has been skipped by Sa Sagar, Dr. Sagar. He asked whether it's an anterior, could, can it be an anterior ah. canal? I saw that question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it could be an anterior canal. Uh, we had done the, I mean, I had checked whether for anterior canal. It does not look like, but yeah, uh, it can be that the that the autoconia could be lying somewhere uh, in the common crust, mm -hmm. or uh, so that's that's why we added that the uh, NECA maneuver. NECA maneuver. Yeah, so for that purpose also. So yeah, yes, taking into consideration that it could be somewhere, some autoconia <laughs> may be lurking somewhere in the common crust. Common crust also. So uh, I would like to add one point: why it is not anterior? Because in anterior canal BPPV, the nystagmus will be down beating. Down. And yeah. it could be with or without a torsional nystagmus. So in our patient, it was completely torsional. It was very much a torsional component in which the upper pole was beating to the right side. Therefore, we considered it as posterior canal right-sided BPP. And uh, so we have one question for Dr. Solara. Solara, ma'am, are you here? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, there is a question from Dr. Uh, uh, Pushpanjali, ma'am. If posturography is functional test to de uh, to decide the disability due to vertigo, is there accurate inventory for disability scores as a data? Or do you add all equilibrium score like composite score, sensory score at the end? And well, what I, okay, so let me explain a bit. I don't know, um, when I look at the composite score, the composite score itself, if it's less than 35, I can say that the patient is at risk of fall. And then, based on the pattern, I can say what are the rehabilitation methodology to follow. I will see the patient again in three months, six months, depending on what is the protocol we decide. If I consistently see no change in the composite score and no change in the sensory um, um, ratios, that's when I say that there is a disability that is continuous, it has been seen since this date and there is no improvement. But it's rare for me not to see a minimal change. At least I see between 8 to 12% uh, change, at least uh, after vestibular rehabilitation. 
But again, if for six or eight months, the ratio, sorry, uh, after treatment of six to eight months, and I still don't see a huge change, we're still on the risk of fall, that's where I can say this person is a disabled person, this person needs someone to be with them at the entire, entire time, that's where I consider it a disability. I hope I answered the question. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, there is a question from Dr. Ashwarya. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you examine or how do you manage a case with cognitive disabilities? Like okay. if, yeah. Well, um, I find CDP to be the easiest test to perform and compare to other vestibular tests. Why? Because I've learned, especially with children, uh, uh, children with autism, children with um, uh, the Down syndrome, etc. Because the bulk of it is just standing there still, okay, not requiring a lot of a lot of movement yourself. You're only asked. You're only informing them what's going to happen. So you try your best to inform them, and then the rest is made by the computerized dyna dynamic posturography condition. This is where I think you get the feedback. You don't need them to follow instruction like other tests. I have found it myself to be the easiest to perform on these type of children or these children with these um, impairments. So, um, thank uh, you. What about other investigations like uh, VNG and uh, gate examination and other exam examinations? Do they correlate? Is this the question? With, uh, no, not exactly with this question, but how do you manage a case of with uh, cognitive impairments like general not exactly okay. to posturography um, i'm going to i'm going to give my personal experience i have yep. reached a, a, a I, re, I reached a time where i decide that the question is what's our aim my aim is to diagnose this patient spending an entire day to get vamp on a patient is for me more or less not very efficient as long as I can get an overall view from case history and uh, tests that don't require a lot of uh, feedback from the patient directly in these cognitive cases, this is what I'm going to use. There, for example, um, it, it could be for ex very hard for me to record, uh, op uh, to record the oculomotor testing on some children okay, that have autism, etc. But I can do it maybe with a toy and without using a recording. So I need to adapt all my tests to these children or, or to these special population. Uh, that's for VNG, for example. I discovered personally that I cannot put a mask on an autistic child. Forget it, they will not accept it. So you need to think outside of the box. Yes. Yes. And I, uh, I just wanna say one thing that has helped me personally recently is that whenever I'm doing VAMP on children with cognitive, I use, in addition to the electrode, I use stickers with smiley faces, colorful stickers at the same okay. time, and I put it other places. So do you, That's do you a very good idea, ma'am. OK, yes. thank you. Yes, uh, I think Dr. Avinash wants to say something on this one. Uh, sure. Sir, Avinash, sir? Bijlani, sir? Actually, uh, uh, I just came back. I had gone out for something urgent. Okay, okay. I was not able to be a part of the recent uh, conversation. So the question is, how do you manage people with cognitive impairments? Because your topic was physical examination and... Uh... Uh, that's true. That's true. But uh, that's something I would, uh, again, refer to somebody like uh, uh, Dr. Solara. <laughs> okay, she has uh, already answered. Uh, no, let me Prati. ask about it. Prati. Dr. Alfarhan. Dr. Alfarhan. Yes. Um, uh, thank you for the great lecture for, uh, from all the speakers. My question is uh, for Dr. Solara. Uh, one of the limitations of the computerized dynamic posturography is uh, malingering. And uh, its uh, results can be affected by uh, the intention of the examined subject to get poor uh, scores. Especially in some countries like the United States, they use it to determine the degree of disability and the compensations. Mm -hmm. So first, um, uh, I want you to highlight how you recognize and identify such uh, special patterns for malingering or functional overlay uh, subjects. 
and mm -hmm. the how it's affected by the like the mood, the motivation. Uh, um, the results got affected by the mood, the motivation, mm -hmm. and the emotional status of the uh, subject. Thank so you. Let no, thank you for your question. So let me start with malingering. Um, for me, that's why I said I don't only rely on uh, the green, red colors. I, I read the raw data. And this is the first thing. Read the raw data. The raw data will tell you if there is an exaggeration in movement or they're actually genuine movement. That's number one. Number two, I usually mix the... Um, I do the test. I start by condition one, condition two. And then I mix the conditions so the patient cannot know exactly what is coming. This will, um, uh, I will not give instruction to these patients because I know their medical legal cases or their cases uh, uh, specific for disability. I will not give, uh, I will give the instruction at the beginning and then, then I'm going to say these are, um, I'm going to, um, it's going to be a surprise what's coming next. That's number two. Number three, what I do is, I always do the MCT and ADT, and the MCT and ADT are reflexes. So rarely could some, uh, it's almost impossible that someone can, can fake a reflex. A reflex is there. So based on all of these information and based on the raw data, specifically on the sway angles, et cetera, I can tell you which one of these uh, patients is actually malingering, yes or no. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't have the time to actually go through the malingerer. That's an entire uh, different lecture because we go at sway tracing one by one. And the other thing also that I, 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 it's very interesting. No one with an abnormality can do well on condition five and six and not do and not do well on condition one and two. So usually what happens is that condition one and two, they start faking it if they're malingering because they know it's an easy and then when I start giving them the difficult condition, they do better. And that's directly where I know something is wrong with my data. This is some. This is a patient that is malingering. Um, but regarding the question regarding mood and uh, uh, emotional, uh, how they come to us, it's very important. I usually like to do my posturographies in the morning, mm -hmm. especially for children, so they're fresh. For adult, Okay, depending on, depending on the case history, I'll decide where I'm going to put the patient. Because if the patient is depressed every time, every single day, that's not going to affect a lot. But I have seen it. These are the patients with depression. I find that the CDP will help them the most. Why? Because they feel that no one is believing them. Talking back to the PD, no one is believing them that something is wrong. Me coming and showing them, oh, you're right, something is wrong with you. Through it is functional, maybe I won't find anything abnormal on their other test. This provides them with um, emotional security. And you're going to see these are the patients that do best because someone finally believed them. Um, I hope I understood your question correctly regarding the second part. And if you need any further clarification, just. Yeah, you me. did. You did, you Perfect. did, and uh, your answer is great. Uh, one Thank more you, question, sir. because I, I sure. think it's uh, uh, very important to be highlighted. Uh, is that one of the limitations of the computerized dynamic osteography is that it lacks, it cannot localize the site of lesion, and it mm -hmm. doesn't uh, reflect directly the vestibular functions. And okay. the, the main limitation is that it cannot localize the site of lesion. So, some researchers, they develop what's called heat shaking computerized dynamic osteography, adding mm -hmm. some sort of vestibular stimulation to the uh, CBD uh, mm -hmm. would um, make it more sensitive to detect the vestibular impairment. So we'd love to hear uh, if you have experience with yes. the heat shaking with computerized dynamography and how you did find it uh, beneficial. Okay, so let me tell you, we're not only doing head shaking, we're also doing vibration. So we're going an extra level because we believe based on different uh, studies that uh, what is the CDP providing us information about? Mainly it's providing information about the ophthalmos, uh, both the utricle and saccular. It's true that there are conflicting studies regarding its relation to them. But what we have found is that uh, if we take at the second a dual activity that is vestibular, and by this I mean vibration induced nystagmus or head shake. It is providing more accurate information regarding the otolus. We are um, highlighting, if you want, the um, the importance of the the importance of the uh, utricle and saccules role. Now I haven't mentioned it in my presentation, but usually condition five, to be more specific, is providing me 
the best information regarding the otolus. It's giving me more specifically the utricle. Now, this is these are studies that are not fully published and some are in, in the process, but I can say it that condition five usually is linked to a utricular problem. And the head shaking study and the uh, vibration induced nystagmus are confirming it more and more. Yes, sir. thank you very much, ma'am. Sure. Thank you, uh, Alpha Girl, sir, for your nice inputs. So we will wrap up today's session and uh, we will meet again on 12, uh, 24th of April with some important topics. So thank you, all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, ma'am. And your videos on Facebook are ultimate, ma'am, that big, back to basics. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So uh, we will uh, finish. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you, Dr. Solara, for a wonderful presentation on uh, computerized dynamic posterography. Thank you all. Thank you, Bijalani, sir. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Solara. Thank you, Dr. Bijalani, Dr. Henry, and uh, Dr. Vijay Rubey. Thank you, sir. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Swarup and Pratik for the moderation. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you.